Right. I think we can go ahead. Hopefully, Alder Carter will join us. Um, so I'll call to order the Finance Committee meeting of Tuesday, September 14th, 2021, and ask staff to call the roll, please. Council President Abbas. Present. Uh, Alder Carter. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Furman. Present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Curry. Here. Mary of Quorum. Thank you. Can we have the meeting instructions, please? Yep. And I just sent Alder Carter a, another invite. Um, welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. Members of the committee, if you're able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you're able, please activate your video when you're speaking. In this meeting, panelists have the ability to mute and un unmute themselves. Panelists also have the ability to add pronouns after their names if they choose. Uh, please do not alter the current naming convention. Please simply add text after your name. Please use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. Staff, please use the raise hand feature when you are asked a question. The chair will do their best to call in committee members in the order in which hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Uh, there are no members of the public who have registered to speak, so Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you. And our only agenda item is the capital budget. Um, and so we will just go into our presentations on that. And uh, Dave, I will hand it over to you. You'll see on the screen the order for today, which will start with the police department, move through the engineering, uh, elements of the capital budget and transportation and wrap up with public works. All right, let's start with the police department then. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, good evening, everyone. The 2020 capital budget uh, addresses the primary goal of maintaining and deploying our existing technology services and equipment which are essential to our public safety mission. The 2022 police capital budget contains no new requests. Assistant Chief John Patterson, who oversees the department's community outreach and support functions will briefly summarize our existing technology services and equipment program. Thank you, Chief. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, as the Chief said, uh, very similar to the fire department's uh, ongoing program, um, this is very similar, and it's providing uh, ongoing capital funds for us to update some of the critical systems and technologies that uh, really have become um, important for modern-day policing. So things uh, to think about that would be included in this are like our in-car video systems, router systems and squad cars, um, audio-visual equipment at the training center, uh, some of our forensic investigative technology, record software modules, things like that. Um, so no new uh, changes from uh, what was discussed uh, in previous years to this particular program. Um, two things that I would just mention since they've come up uh, in conversations with many of you in the past, uh, just to give them a quick honorable mention, uh, because you'll continue to hear us uh, discuss them in future years uh, in future processes are the, the two major projects of the North District and the property and evidence facility, not reflected here, but uh, just keeping it on your radar, I think, for next year. Uh, so we uh, can have that same conversation again. Uh, but that's all I have. If there are any questions. Thank you, uh, Chiefs. Are there questions for police? Seeing none. Uh, Alder Carter. Um, my question is, with the equipment program, does this um, also include possible increase in equipment for the uh, town of Madison and additional police? This is mainly to, to upgrade or to replace existing technology, so there's nothing here reflecting 
uh, needs for any uh, tower related things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder President Abbas. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Chief Patterson, could you please also give us a quick update uh, on Northside Police Station and future growth? I remember that project was last year, year before last year, it was in a horizon list. And it's not in horizon list anymore. I'm just curious about uh, on the Northside Police Station capacity. Uh, sure, Alder. Um, as, as you know, uh, that building was opened, I think, the year before I started, uh, and, you know, decisions made back then, back in 97, uh, were to essentially build the facility to capacity. Uh, so when I walked in as a rookie, um, already closet spaces were being used as, as things other than closets, uh, and uh, since then, it's continued, continued to, to grow, and uh, that building is, is really at beyond capacity state right now. Um, so, you know, what uh, you'll hear us to continue to talk about is some of the anticipated growth on the east side of Madison. Um, a few years back, we did do some redistricting where we moved the East Town Mall corridor uh, away from the North District and into the East District uh, to kind of address some of the capacity concerns that we had north. Um, but now, as the city continues to grow, I think we really have to be wary about what is occurring on the east side of Madison. Um, because I think we'd be in danger of having the East District uh, move to capacity as well if we're not able to um, upgrade that facility and kind of adjust for future growth in the city. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thanks. Are there any other questions for police? All right. Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Chief, Assistant Chief Teague. And we'll go on to the next. Okay. Should I jump in here, folks? Go ahead, Rob. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Alders. Um, I'm Rob Phillips, City Engineer. The Engineering Division has six budgets, and uh, the principal in charge of each of those budget sections will go over other budgets uh, for you this evening. It uh, looks like we're starting with Ped Bike, so that would be Chris Petikowski. Hi everyone, Chris Petikowski, City Engineering. And uh, the first one we're gonna talk about here is uh, pedestrian and bicycle. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so major changes from, from uh, last year's budget. Uh, we've got, got a number of them, um, Autumn Ridge Path was uh, added to the SIP from our horizon list. Uh, we were able to, it uh, looks like secure federal funding for that project. So that was um, that was great news. Um, uh, that is located in 2024 right now, currently. Uh, also uh, with the bikeways program, we are proposing a budget increase uh, each year to uh, try to keep up with um, creating additional bike, path, bike paths in our greenways as they are being reconstructed through uh, watershed study project areas. So uh, that's a, a new uh, an increase to an, to an existing program. Hermina Street, Starkweather Creek Ped Bike Bridge is a new uh, Ped Bike Bridge over Starkweather Creek that was identified in the, the Darbo Worthington Neighborhood Resource Team. Uh, we proposed that uh, to be scheduled for construction in 2027. Uh, Old Middleton Underpass, which is a new uh, ped bike underpass um, near Old Middleton and um, uh, kind of just west of Whitney Whitney Way, um, our, our, we increased uh, uh, have a, a budget increase. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, to include uh, uh, stormwater uh, work with the project as well as, as uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, the TIF in, the, in, the, uh, in that area. Uh, the next one is Troy Drive Railroad Bridge, where we are uh, changing, proposing a change in scope to the project from a what was uh, previously shown as a ped bike uh, underpass just adjacent to Troy Drive um, to, to improve that uh, uh, 
uh, current uh, pedestrian culvert. Um, we're we're proposing instead a new, a whole new railroad bridge that would span the entire right of way, which would allow for um, bike lanes and sidewalks on both sides of the street. Uh, this is um, this project uh, depends on the coordination with the with WSDOT and getting a grant uh, from WSDOT and also the WSOR Railroad. So um, we uh, included design money for the bridge and construction funds in 2023. Um, and then lastly, the, uh, the Safe Routes to School and Ped Bike Enhancement um, programs have been consolidated into a new program called Safe Streets that uh, will be um, discussed in the traffic engineering budget. So those those two items that, that used to be in our budget are now in, in the traffic engineering. Um, uh, just in general for the program itself, uh, we really continue to prioritize our, our sidewalk program where we go around the city uh, once every 10 years and, and repair sidewalks. Um, that's uh, always important for us. Um, again, uh, uh, we did increase that, that, that uh, uh, or, or did propose that increase that to the bikeways program. Um, we do have a, a potential earmark out there that's um, we're hopeful for for the Autumn Ridge Path that would uh, uh, just reduce our our geo funding uh, elsewhere uh, if we were able to get that. Um, uh, we do have MPO requests for federal funding for that same Autumn Ridge Path, and um, as I mentioned before, the uh, draft. Tip uh, from the MPO does include that project, so so we're looking to get that, that federal funding, which is great. Um, we have the the new NRT request for the new bridge, and um, as I mentioned, and then um, just uh, kind of an update on our our project prioritization uh, process that we've been working on, um, and continue to hope to uh, develop uh, this fall. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, all the projects, uh, in, in this program, uh, do have a positive impact on either safety equity or, or ped bike and transit. And that's, that's it for the presentation. Thanks, Chris. Are there questions on engineering, uh, ped bike? President Abbas. Yeah, thank you very much. Good, great to see the Troy Drive, and I'm sure Northside resident and all the Miyadze district people will be very happy. My quick question is about the so the design process will start in 2022, and probably construction will start in 2023, uh, and and it's all depend on uh, uh, Wisconsin Railway grant process, correct? If we get that grant. Yeah, the the grant. Um uh we would be applying for the grant uh in february and um and work on the design yes uh that that does the the, the budget does assume an 80 percent uh match of federal funds for the project and then i should i should uh include too there's a there's a couple of ways to to get the funds this one is having the having the railway or railroad operator apply for the funds and, and we uh, coordinate with them. That was kind of how this budget was initially crafted. We might just apply for the funds ourselves um, and uh, and work with the railroad um, and have us be the <clears throat> the uh, the grantee of the of the grant. Um, that may push the construction out a year um, just for the process uh, to kind of play out, but. Um, we're we're excited to to get this project done, and it's a it's a high priority for us. Yeah, very exciting news. And one last follow up question: So the design which you're going to create it will accommodate emergency vehicles, including fire department, to go through under the bridge, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the update. Alder Alder Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris, I just have one question. Well, I have two. Um, one of the bikeway 
Bike Ways program. Um, can you just touch on, um, uh, it's being increased by 1.4 million. Um, can you just touch on where um, the vision is to, to create more um, bike ways? And, uh, and are these bike ways also uh, pedestrian, ped bike? Sure. Um, yeah, so our, our uh, original program was in the neighborhood of uh, 600,000 or 650, I can't remember exactly. Um, and we proposed a, a $300,000 increase each year, uh, which which gets to the, the 1.4 million. So what we're thinking uh, here originally uh, for next year's funds, um, uh, Janet and the stormwater utility is working on a a greenway reconstruction in the in the Wexford Hills area, which is kind of by Old Sock Road and uh, um, and the Beltline. Um, so what would what we would be proposing is as as while well those greenways are getting proposed, to also um, if if our bike plan shows that a that you know we had a a, a bike path or a pedestrian path proposed in that area to to use those funds while they're reconstructing the greenway for stormway improvements to include the, the pet and bike path too. So yeah, and it definitely would be multi-use uh, for pedestrians and bicycles. So we would kind of uh, be moving around with the, the stormwater utility as they plan their greenway restoration. Okay. And then the other thing is the, um, the earmark, uh, for Autumn Ridge Path, is that the um, the grant that came out of both uh, uh, Senator Baldwin and um, Assembly Pokan's office not too long ago? Is that what you applied for? That's correct. Yep. Okay, and then finally. Um, when creating these projects you have uh, that impacts one or more of the safety, equity, and uh, ped bike transit. And I know that in uh, my district, there was some issues with lighting. Is that something that um, we will continue to do uh, to provide safety is having some sort of lighting on our bike paths? Certainly. Yeah, that's actually... Uh... Uh, one of the things we do with the bike waste program or, or have done in the past um, uh, is, is look at areas that, that could use lighting. And if those are, if there are those areas, I would, you know, uh, certainly don't hesitate to um, contact myself or, or Rob or Yang. Um, and we can, we can take a look at those. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alder. Alder Revere. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Chris. This isn't really a, a question um, or a comment, but as it relates to the Main Street improvements, and I note that uh, this proposed executive budget does re does increase the funding for the Main Street improvement project because of the higher local match required uh, by the feds. Uh, you might not be aware of this, but the council recently created a new uh, tax incremental finance district in the Regent Street corridor. It's called TID 48. And when we were drawing up the TID 48 boundaries, uh, I had conversation with the TIF staff about possibly using uh, that new TID to help fund the Main Street improvements. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And if you could reach out at your convenience to the TIF staff to see if it's practicable uh, to perhaps supplant the geo borrowing, all are part of the geo borrowing uh, executive budget that's proposed for Main Street uh, and, and use uh, TID funds instead. And, and if, if you could then circle me back into the conversation, we could uh, work on a budget amendment if, again, this is practicable. Okay, certainly, I'll, I'll do that uh, right away. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Any other questions for engineering ped bike? All right, seeing none, uh, Rob, let's go on to the next. 
Okay, facilities is next, and Brian Cooper will be taking that one for us. Thanks, Rob. Hello, everybody. Brian Cooper, facilities. Um, uh, our group, uh, uh, a lot of what our group does is uh, oversee a lot of the development work for a number of the uh, city agencies for a lot of the major projects at the city. Uh, but uh, we also have our own uh, budget requests in facilities, and it's represented by nine programs and, in this, uh, in this case, two projects as well. Um, the nine programs, I think, could generally be summarized as um, our ongoing um, maintenance and improvement program that's based on uh, keeping record of all the assets uh, in the city buildings that engineering maintains. Um, and so those show up in a schedule on an ongoing basis. Um, there is some unique, there, I would say one of the unique or two of the unique programs uh, that aren't, don't fit that model are the CCB remodels. Um, and then also the energy improvement program uh, that we oversee. Uh, the two projects uh, going forward are for the Fairchild building um, that the city owns and also the Sale Street uh, building for traffic engineering and parking utility. Um, in terms of the slides here, um, we uh, made a major change in the CCB improvement number by going downward uh, quite a bit, about 1.7, 1.8 million. Uh, for two reasons, um, um, and, and I should mention that the CCB improvements are mainly driven by Dane County, uh, given that they are the the, the major um, maintenance uh, lead for the for the CCB. But uh, they got a grant uh, working with our staff uh, from the Department of Energy for some window replacements. Uh, they also reduced the number of windows to be replaced, so there's a significant reduction uh, there for that effort. Um, the CCB remodels, um, I believe some of you have followed along with that program, project, or program, excuse me, um, but we're asking for a little bit more funding in 2023. Um, that's primarily to complete the common council offices and the office of the independent monitor at the same time that we do the first floor remodel work for treasurer, assessor, clerk, and Department of Civil Rights, which uh, if, if uh, we're moving Department of Civil Rights to the first floor in the uh, current parks area. Um, as you'll see here, the funding for the construction of the fourth and fifth floor is currently on the horizon uh, list in this SIP. Uh, Fairchild building improvements. Um, we're asking for additional funding in 2022 and 2023 than we've asked in the past. Uh, this is primarily dedicated to major mechanical upgrades. Um, also, we had a structural assessment of the building and we need to do some structural improvements to the building uh, for the long term. Uh, the horizon list planning, we found over the last couple of years that uh, we think we can do a adequate to good job uh, with our own team estimating these projects. Um, and so we've asked for quite a bit less than has been proposed in the past. Uh, park facility improvements, we have uh, identified a couple projects uh, that have bumped our request up at Forest Hill Mausoleum and the Brittingham Boathouse. Um, Sale Street remodel, uh, we're currently um, about to kick off the project there to do uh, kind of a major look at their programming and all their mechanical electrical plumbing um, and determine the best path forward and be prepared next year to uh, propose a uh, construction budget related to that scope. And um, street facility improvement, um, uh, well, note here that it increased 375,000 over the next um, four years. Um, let's see, uh, as I mentioned before, we oversee the energy improvement budget. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, sort of a major effort here uh, with our own facilities to um, meet a lot of the goals of the 100% renewable energy and zero net carbon um, goals that the city has. Um, we uh, These projects are designed completely by staff at, at, in engineering. Um, we um, bid and often purchase all of this items directly. And, um, and in many, many cases, uh, we do all of the installation work with our green power team and our Green Power Team is a, uh, a program that was developed in 2016 where 
we link up um, master electricians with um, green power trainees, often from uh, mostly folks that are underrepresented in the workforce, uh, to go through a trainee program to learn how to, um, well, do all things electrical, but primarily solar uh, solar installations and uh, lighting retrofit installations. So we have a significant amount of dollars requested in that program uh, sustained, sustained over uh, the entire uh, SIP request. And I, in fact, uh, we have a, a, a program all the way out through 2030 uh, uh, laid out. Uh, Fairchild building improvements I mentioned already, uh, sales street facility remodel, um, mentioned some of the issues there. Um, we already discussed the CCB significant improvement, uh, significant reduction in the request there. And then um, the uh, CCB office remodel is slightly complicated to explain, but generally what we're trying to do is address the first floor uh, design in 2022 and 2023 for construction, but also include the Common Council offices and Office of the Interior Monitor in that work as well, despite the fact that they will be on the fifth floor. Uh, so I think that's the major overview for facilities uh, management. Thanks, Brian. Are there questions for facilities? Not seeing any questions for you, Brian. So thank you much. Get off easy tonight. Thank you very much. And we'll go on to the next. Major Streets is next. Back to Chris Petakowski. All right. So on uh, Major Streets, uh, we've had a, a, a couple of um, new projects added uh, from the Horizon List. The first one is Atwood Avenue. Um, we're proposing uh, in 2023. Um, we, we do have that one shown in the MPO draft tip is getting federal funds. So, so that got moved off the horizon list. Um, John Nolan Drive, uh, we did uh, uh, increase the, the, the project budget um, to reflect uh, kind of an updated uh, project over two years, 26 and 27. Um, and also uh, did receive uh, or, or in the draft tip uh, from MPO that we are being shown as receiving federal funds for that one, although not uh, fully 60% uh, funding like the others. A Mineral Point Road is a new project that is getting funded by the MPO um, in 27. That is from the Beltline to uh, High Point Road. Uh, we'll also be including some, uh, some safety improvements with that and, and possible uh, highway safety improvement program funds as well. Um, neighborhood traffic management and pedestrian improvements, similarly um, to uh, in the pet bike budget, those uh, were consolidated into the Safe Streets Madison, which is in the traffic engineering budget, which I'll hear about uh, later. A Pleasant View Road Phase 1 uh, project uh, estimate uh, increased um, and uh, and the uh, the year is advanced to 2022, so that would get started uh, next summer. And the University Avenue project um, is not an increase for us, but uh, MMSD is uh, going to be installing a, a major sewer interceptor with that project and and uh, uh, be included in the project. Uh, so for um, the program, uh, we continue to prioritize the system preservation programs, both pavement management and reconstruct streets, um, particularly the, the pavement management and, and trying to utilize some, some low cost methods to, to extend the life of our streets. We do uh, include any, any you know, work with the TIF staff to try to include uh, any TIF projects in the program. Um, as I mentioned, we had some updated estimates for the some of the major WISDOT projects, Pleasant View and John Nolan. Uh, we also have some earmarks that we've applied for uh, at Wood Avenue from Representative Pokran and University Avenue from Senator Baldwin that um, we're still hopeful on, uh, which would uh, uh, reduce, uh, e even though those are showing as funded by um, uh, 
uh, the MPO that could reduce our, our geo uh, elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned, also the, the our new all all of our new MPO requests were approved. So John Nolan Mineral Point Atwood, um, that, that that was great news. Uh, we got a lot of. A lot of projects in the hopper for that. Um, and then, uh, again, with the project prioritization that we're working on, um, still kind of a work in progress, but uh, as I mentioned before, with, um, with I'd like a lot of these ones as well um, have a, are having a positive impact on under safety equity, fed bike transit, or in, in a lot of conditions, uh, the underground utilities uh, that would be associated with the project. Thanks, Chris. Any questions on major streets? Alder Conklin. Uh, it's not really a question, but I was just wondering, can you go back to the next slide or the previous slide for me real quick, please? Anything else, Alder Conklin? Uh, no, that will be all. Thank you so much. Okay. Other questions for Major Streets? Aldo Healy. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, for the amount, uh, John Nolan Mineral Point, the amount indicated, is that including what's uh, added for the MPOs? Yeah, it, it, it includes the... Um the the MPO funding and actually uh, it, it includes an an additional uh, component of GO borrowing uh, because we didn't quite get the full sixty percent of um, of the federal funds for that one. Thank you. If the question is, uh, are the federal funds shown in the budget? They are not. Correct. They don't come through the city, so therefore they're not shown in the city's budget. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Any other questions on major streets? All right, not seeing any. So uh, we'll go on to, I think other projects is next. Yep, the other budget is for uh, things that don't fit in our other five budgets. There's just a couple here, and Greg is going to go after them. Greg Freeze is going to talk about those. Good evening, everybody. Um, so just a couple changes from last year. Um, you'll note the budget looks very similar with one tiny, tiny change, and that is largely um, the warning sirens. We have moved all of those in the budget basically to 2020 um, to 2024. Um and let me make sure I got that right. Yep. Um, and we're going to do all all the ones we think that we will probably need for the foreseeable future in 2024. Uh, we're finishing up one that has taken a, admittedly a fair amount of time up at uh, up near the airport, um, mostly just bureaucratic stuff because we're trading easements and stuff with the county up there. So it just takes time to work through the legal process. Um, the aerials, there's also a slight change due to our requirements for our stormwater EPA permit. Uh, we used to do, some of you might remember, um, we do aerial photos every other year. And then um, on the, um, let's see, on the, so in 22, we're doing contours photos and we now have to do impervious area. Um, the impervious area is needed for us to model our stormwater runoff in accord with our, our EPA and WDNR permit. Then in 24, we'll just do photos again. And in 26, we would do again the contours, photos, and impervious area. So the budget, you know, cycles back and forth. And it does cost us a bit more to do the impervious area now. So we, but but that's that's a new necessary requirement for us to, to meet our, our modeling requirements from the DNR. So so there's a slight increase there. Um, waste oil collection, uh, the only other real change is those, those are costing us a little bit more than we had previously estimated. Uh, we only have two left to do, um, Glenway and Monroe, or not Monroe, um, Monona. 
uh, drive by the golf course, by Monona uh, Golf Course. And uh, in the printed material, we were going to do Glenway this year, and then we skip a year, and then we do um, Monona Drive. Uh, it turned out as we got into this this year, we actually are working on Monona Drive because that has issues that just can't wait to 23. So um, so if you dig into the printed part of this, we, we ended up flopping it since the, since the budget uh had been proposed but we really didn't have any choice so monona drive is going this year and uh, glenway will go in 2023 so um with that um let's see does anybody you could have gone to the next slide sorry i was rambling on without going to the next slide um does anybody have any questions for me thanks greg are there any questions on the engineering other budget Not seeing any, Greg, so I think you're off the hook. Thank you, everyone. And Rob, I think that takes us to the utilities. Uh, it does, yes. Uh, through utilities. So Mark Motor is going to take it. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Motor from Engineering. Going to go through the, the sewer utility budget. Um, the majority of the sewer utility budget, as in past years, is included in the major streets budget. Um, we do have, you know, that's just in terms of just because it's just easier to, to track everything project by project rather than by the, the individual utilities. Um, the budget is consistent with 2021, with the exception that two that there's two new projects and one new program. Um, the major changes would be the, the engineering sycamore cold storage structure, which is a $200,000 $200, project, which is a, it's a fabric storage, storage facility uh, that we're planning out at Sycamore. Um, which is basically where our, your, our existing materials handling site is. Um, the second project that is a new new project is the utilities materials handling site, which is we've we're running out of room at uh, at Sycamore, and we're looking you know, in terms of the next seven years, it's probably looking to to it's going to end up being taken out of out of service. Um, in terms of you know additional, we just don't we've run out of space. Um, and then the, finally, the program is the backwater valve replacement program, which is a program that basically is, you know, for, for people that on demand can request um, backwater valves to provide additional protection to their homes for from a, a sanitary sewer backup. Uh, can you correct our um, oh, next slide? The highlights of the budget are, you know, the sewer funding is, you know, more or less we have the pavement management, and reconstruction streets. We've decreased and due to a lot, you know, some of the project locations, we do, what we do is we end up looking through all the TV for all of the individual streets to identify where, our, where our, you know, where we've got problems. We don't want to replace sewers that are in good shape. Um, so as a result, we aren't necessarily replacing sewers on some, some of the streets that are selected for the overall um, project because they're, if they're determined to be in good shape or if they're determined that we can line the sewer, which is, you know, our trenchless solution, which is very cost effective, um, that's another, you know, potential what we what we'll end up doing. So what I did in terms of funding, we've shifted it over to some of the major street projects where we're anticipating some higher costs. Um, University Avenue and Atwood are expected to be fairly costly projects in terms of sewers. Um, Atwood's, you know, you have groundwater to deal with, and you know, close to the lake. And University Avenue is just has just so much traffic. Um, we've also did some um, shifted for funding for the bike path where. That's the Cannonball Path off of Fish Hatchery Road, which is behind Madison Newspapers. That's a, a project where we need to upgrade our sewer. Um, and then some impact fees. We, we the Pumpkin Hollow impact fee, which is Hepker and Portage Road. We This project, there seems to be a lot of demand from, from developers and contacting um, I, both myself and the water utility about getting facilities to this area. Um, so there's, there's pending development out there that there there's appears to be a need for that for for a sewer to be extended across the highway. But right now we're on the the west side of the interstate. We have to get across the highway and go through some properties. Um, but in general, as far as you know, the overall funding for the project is consistent, or the for the the overall funding for the budget is consistent with 2021. Um, other than we've other than the the cold storage facility and the materials handling site and the backwater valve program. Um, the sewer reconstruction budget 
We did do some shifting of, of money around because the developer of the GE medical site decided that they were going to build the sewer on Femrite. Um, so in turn, what we I removed that that funding from 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 the sewer reconstruction and put that into um, more or less I shifted it into a street project, which is the the Omeda Drive, which is right that's the the north south street off of Femrite. And, and and so instead of the money being spent on Femrite, it'll be in, spent on Omeda Drive, which is 100% accessible. So we'll be, we'll be re- receiving that money back. Um, just like I mentioned before, the we have the cold storage facility that's going to be built in a fabric building. We're hoping for 2022. Uh, we just need to you know protect protect our equipment. Um, the utilities materials site, which I mentioned briefly before, that's more or less it's a, for like dredge drying material dredge drying bed materials for like ponds, things of that nature. Um, it's also for surplus construction equipment or not equipment, but materials. But, you know, if you end up having excess, you know, broken, you know, old manholes, we, you know, that don't, you know, if there's castings, things of that nature, things that are, you know, valves, things of um, different, different things that, that don't, we can't just bring to the landfill that we, that we store some of a lot of the things that we'll end up reusing. Um, so that's, that's kind of what that, that material site is, is intended for. That's going to be uh, 2023 when we're looking to purchase next year is more or less just looking for a location. We don't have a current location right now. Um, and then that backwater valve program, that started out as a pilot program in, in the 2020. And we've been doing it with street reconstructions. A lot of, there's been a lot of interest in terms of people. Well, the way it worked out is we, we included on targeted street reconstructions where there was, we knew that there were problems. We did it on Monroe Street. We did it on a few other projects where streets where they were close to the lake. Um, and as a result, the other half of the program for the pilot program was to more or less an on-demand for, for people to, you know, if they are interested in the program, they could reach out to us. And so what we've done is we reached out to areas, you know, well, we did do a mailer for, we've done mailers for racial equity and social justice where we can focus on areas where there's a need for people are also in, in, in this need in terms of financially for, for this program. It's a great program. So the program in itself, the, the on-demand is more or less, we're, we're re- we will reimburse people 75% up to $1,500 to install a backwater valve, which is really essentially a um, a device that, you, that 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 protects your home from a sanitary sewer backups because I mean sewer backups are, are extremely costly for for people to to um, to you know to, to actually go through the process of cleanup and deal with repairs especially if people have um, remodeled basements and things of that nature so um, all of these you know in other words as far as the inquiries we've had 161 inquiries for people that are on this on demand portion that for this backwater valve program. And 70 prop properties have been notified to get the three quotes. And so far, there's been two that have gone through the whole process. So we're looking at $100,000 for 2022. Originally, I had $40,000. But then there was a newspaper article that was released. And all of a sudden, we had a lot of demand for, for these backwater valves. Um, and so that is how we've, you know, we, we do have a little bit of an increase in, in that to 100,000, then it's $40,000 after the 2023 to 2027. So it tapers off for the next four years after that. Um, just in, as in, you know, continuous sanitary sewer is the goal of all of our programs with the sewer utility. Um, sewer backups are, you know, as I mentioned before, it's super expensive to, um, to, you know, to deal with, and they have even a greater impact on people who don't have the reserve funds um, to recover from some from this event. So, but in general, the city we're doing you know extremely well. Our operations is top notch. We're you know we're averaging less than twenty five backups a year since 2014. and we've had nine backups in twenty twenty one, which you know we're, we're doing well. We had ten backups last year. So, in, gen, in just in terms of a benchmark, the the municipal benchmark for that is you know sixty three for for a city of our size. So. Um, depending on one one measuring tool and the other one says there's 229. So, you know, when we're, we're handling less than 25, we're doing very well. So I think that's about all I have as far as the, the three utilities. I'm open for any kind of questions that people may have. Thanks, Mark. Are Thank there you. questions about the sewer utility? It was a very comprehensive rundown. You've answered everybody's questions. Thank you. 
All right. I think uh, Stormwater is next then. Thanks for your time. Greg Fries will take this. So last item for the engineering division this evening. Actually, I'll take it. Um, Actually, yeah, Janet's going to take that. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Janet. That's okay. Um, I'm Janet Schmidt. I'm a principal engineer for the stormwater section. Um, so the stormwater utility uh, currently has zero projects, but we have four four programs: um, the citywide flood mitigation, stormwater quality, our storm system improvements, and our street uh, street cleaning equipment. Um, so from the graph, you can see that our 2022 proposed budget has a significant decrease um, as, as a, um, compared to the 2021. Um, we did have some big changes where we're, we moved um, uh, quite a bit of uh, money from our citywide flood mitigation project um, into the streets major uh, pavement man management for, and another streets major project that Chris had talked about previously. Those are the old Middleton Road um, uh, resurfacing project and then the, the ped bike underpass at Old Middleton Road. Um, we also uh, in, spread out some of our, our projects a little bit more. So we had um, design in one year and, that, and then uh, construction in you know, the coming years. So it kind of flattened the curve, but we're, we're still probably about the same as it was previously. Um, some of the other changes we had um, in, in our big big projects, we tried to couple our stormwater flood mitigation with our stormwater quality projects. So we kind of get uh, a dual bang for the buck and that allows us to help leverage uh, funding, so different funding sources with grants. So we did include quite a few projects that would be uh, uh, dependent on grant funding opportunities. So we would get projects to a certain um, design standpoint and then we, we'd apply for grants. And we do have a, a consultant on board looking for these grant opportunities for us. Um, so we're hoping to be able to leverage some of that funding sources. Um, so the stormwater quality improvements is our, so the citywide flood mitigation is our, probably our biggest program. Then the stormwater quality is, is right up there. Um, we do a lot of uh, work with this that helps us meet our EPA uh, and DNR uh, permit requirements that Greg alluded to earlier. Um, we've increased the budget um, to include some big projects that we identified with our flood studies, um, but would also have dual, again, dual benefits uh, for stormwater quality improvements. But these also require some significant um, additional funding sources. So we've identified those as uh, moving forward only if we get these additional funds. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, we, we, we have about 7.5 million that we identified that would require state or uh, federal funding. Okay, so some of the highlights. Um, so our 2022 budget was significantly lower than the 2021. Um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of our budget is comprised of the uh, citywide flood mitigation and major flood flood projects. Uh, we have some that are in, in design right now that will be going towards construction. Uh, we have uh, several identified that will be starting design and moving towards construction in 2022 or 2023. Um, uh, for the entire SIP, we have about $9.5 million in grants um, flagged. I don't know if that's realistic to, to achieve that, but we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get some grant funding. Um, some of the new projects that bumped up, bumped us up a little bit include some of the major street projects, uh, which is Mineral Point Road, where we do have an existing flood issue. So we would we would uh, put in some flood mitigation funds to help um, take care of that uh, pro problem in, in conjunction with uh, Chris's major project. And then the old Middleton uh, Road underpass. There's a there's a massive flooding issue over there. Um, over by the Oak Crest Tavern, if folks are familiar with that. Um, so we wanted to put in some additional funding to help alleviate that while that project's under construction. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we, we, we're really trying um, hard to try and get some additional funds leverage. I know that this is uh, probably a little bit unrealistic to try and get all the, all the money to fund our projects, but we'll, we'll get them ready. So when these opportunities come up, we're, we're ready to go. So with that, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thanks, Janet. Are there questions on stormwater? Going once, going twice. All right, Janet, you are also off the hook. All right, thank uh, you. 
And thank you, Rob, and everybody else. And we will move on uh, to the transportation department, um, starting with parking. All right. Hello. Good evening. I'm Sabrina Tolly, uh, presenting on the Parking Division's capital budget request. Our uh, request this year just includes uh, one program, the Vehicle Replacement Program. Uh, the goal of this program is to, to replace our vehicles on approximately a 10-year life cycle. Uh, no significant changes um, uh, from, from last year's SIP, although a slight increase in, in funding in 2025 and 2026, uh, $12,000 uh, total for the SIP. Uh, and those reflect uh, just updated uh, cost estimates for those future replacements. Uh, for 2022, our uh, planned replacements include a 2011 uh, truck and also a 2011 uh, snowblower for a total of uh, 54,000. Um, also remaining uh, in our capital budget on the horizon list is the uh, State Street Campus uh, Lake Garage replacement uh, that was placed on the horizon list last year. And uh, we recommended that uh, remain in, in this request pending uh, additional information on, on cost estimates for that project, as well as uh, other funding sources uh, as we go through that RFP process. and. Uh, an evaluation of those proposals. Uh, and I think with, with that, happy to take any questions folks may have. Thanks, Sabrina. Are there questions for parking? President Abbas. Thank you, Sabrina, for a, for a presentation. I have a one quick question about vehicle replacement program as, as uh, City of Madison have 2030 and 2050 sustainability statewide goal reducing carbon emission. And I know fleet department is working, you know, uh, alignment with the with the city's uh, planning on carbon emission. So I'm just curious from your department point of view with replacement, either you're looking into hybrid cars, electric, uh, also, or do you really look into your carbon emission and see in future when you're replacing the car, how much carbon emission you're gonna reduce to align with city plans. I'm just curious about your sustainability policy around replacement. Yeah, so we work uh, with, with fleet on the, the vehicle selection uh, process. Our, our goal is to, uh, to move toward 100% electric as options become available. Um, you know, previously uh, there, there haven't been uh, a lot of great options for some of the larger vehicles or utility vehicles. Uh, for, for snow removal and, and other uses in, in electric. Um, but uh, again, uh, continuing to work with, with fleet um, and they uh, uh, actually lead the kind of procurement process uh, uh, for, for our vehicles. So, so we fund them, but are uh, you know, in alignment and, and work with fleet um, in uh, in accordance with uh, those goals and plans. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. And also regarding heavy vehicle, I know Mahan is really good at championing this and uh, probably no more than me, but Dane County use for, for snow removal and heavy vehicle RNG, renewable natural gas. Probably that's something you could also check it out for if the electric vehicles is not an option to reduce emission. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Revere. Thanks, Mayor. And uh, hi, Sabrina. I just wanted to ask you quickly about the Lake Street part of the State Street Campus parking garage. And I did say garage, not ramp. Since we're <laughs> in a public meeting, <laughs> you get the joke. Uh, anyway, we talked about it briefly last night as it relates to creating a new uh, TIF district to support the construction there. My, my, uh, I should also mention, I have absolutely no problem and support keeping this project on the horizon list for a variety of reasons. But I did wanna ask you something that I think I asked you at this time a year ago, and that is given that the Lake Street uh, part of the garage is now 57 years old and the oldest garage in, in your uh, system bar none, 
Uh, I think last year you had said that you thought there were about five more years of life in that uh, garage. Could you just confirm that and, and confirm that we are still doing preventative maintenance, of course, and you plan to continue to do that given the uncertain timing of, of the replacement garage? Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say there is necessarily a, a finite uh, end of life uh, because, again, we can continue to do uh, the, the necessary maintenance to, um, to keep the garage open um, and, and running uh, safely. Uh, however, it does get to a point where, um, you know, the investments don't make sense to, um, you know, continue to, to put a high dollar amount in, um, in maintenance costs rather than replace. So, uh, you know, certainly we can continue to, to maintain as necessary. It's, it's just a matter of uh, those costs will continue to, to increase uh, with the age of the facility. Um, but the, the direction that we've uh, given uh, in terms of our uh, engineers uh, that do our annual preventive maintenance program uh, is, is to focus on you know, continuing to maintain with an uncertain uh, time frame at this, at this time for exactly when that will be replaced. So uh, continuing to maintain at uh, a high level, um, you know, pending a, I think, clearer timeline on replacement. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Alder, Alder Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Sabrina, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the Lake Street garage also going to be the bus terminal? That's correct. And is there any conversation um, with either Badger bus or Greyhound, whichever, um, about um, contributing to the bus terminal? So I know there have been uh, conversations in the past uh, about cost sharing options. Uh, you know, at this time, I, I don't think there is um, any you know, specific agreement or, or funding that um, is necessarily likely to occur or that is being uh, considered in, in terms of uh, funding mm -hmm. and operating. Mm -hmm. um, but we are uh, committed to having a, a bus terminal at, at um, Lake Street Garage, correct? Yes, uh, that was uh, a required component uh, as well of the, the RFP. Okay, thank you. Do are there any other questions for parking? All right, seeing none, thank you, Sabrina. Thank you. Uh, and I think that is traffic engineering next. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to discuss traffic engineering's uh, capital budget. Um, uh, I also have uh, Keith Pollock uh, from traffic engineering uh, here with me uh, to help answer uh, any questions, and he's our finance, uh, finance guru. Uh, so with that, we have a, a total of three projects and six programs uh, uh, for 2022. Uh, so some major changes uh, involve a new program uh, to purchase and replace equipment used for uh, field operations. Um, so those uh, are uh, you know equipment such as needed to uh, locate the uh, fiber uh, uh, used to uh, equipment used to uh, install streetlights, uh, traffic signals, uh, and the signs. Um, so a total, uh, the project cost will be $350,000. Um, uh, also most of those will be in 2022. And uh, uh, also some of them, uh, a very small portion will be 2024 and 2025. Uh, we also request $1 million more uh, funding for the Jonathan Drive tunnel project. 
uh, uh, to fix the lighting. Uh, uh, there's increased cost and also uh, uh, more importantly, uh, the tunnel's ventilation system uh, needs to be uh, upgraded. Uh, so we thought that uh, it's uh, uh, a good idea and more cost-effective uh, to do everything together instead of coming back later uh, to fix the ventilation system. Um, and uh, we, uh, as Chris mentioned um, uh, from engineering, we also have a new program uh, called Safe Streets Madison. So that's a product of a, a joint subcommittee uh, of a transportation commission and the transportation policy uh, and planning board. Um, so the idea is that uh, uh, to consolidate, consolidate the cyber existing uh, capital program uh, from traffic engineering and engineering uh, that are safety uh, related and uh, put them into one. Um, uh, those programs include uh, the Vision Zero uh, in traffic engineering and also uh, uh, neighborhood traffic management program, um, pedal bike enhancement over uh, arterial streets, and a safe route to school uh, program from uh, engineering. Um, we um, also uh, added the uh, $1 million, uh, which spread over 2022 and 2023 uh, for bicycle enhancements uh, in the East Madison area. Uh, so those will be half a million dollars each year. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, you know, for the bigger program is that we can uh, tackle, um, you know, the same problem, really using, uh, you know, all the tools in our toolbox, instead of, you know, putting them into different categories, different programs, and only apply a portion of the tools that we have to those individual problems. Um, we also request a little bit more funding for the you know, very popular uh, pedal bike enhancement projects. Uh, we had a lot of success with it uh, by improving outreach and equity. Uh, I will just uh, fully talk about it a little bit more later. Um, and also the Safe Route to School program. Uh, so we require a little bit more funding uh, for that. Uh, so overall, uh, for 2022, uh, we're looking at uh, a little bit over $2 million uh, for that whole program. Um, and um, uh, I'm sure many of you uh, have heard uh, uh, the 20 East Printing program, uh, which got a lot of uh, uh, positive media coverage uh, recently, with our phase one projects uh, in two neighborhoods this year. Uh, we're proposing uh, a citywide program um, uh, to change the default speed limit on all our different streets in the city, uh, in the city uh, from 25 mile per hour to 20 mile per hour. Uh, the total cost uh, is $613,000. And um, um, uh, we received a lot of positive feedback from the phase one program. And we really think uh, this will make a lasting impact on the city uh, for the city one program. Uh, with that, uh, could we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so instead of going through, you know, all other uh, uh, programs and projects, since uh, uh, we have uh, quite a few, uh, I'm just going to talk generally about, uh, you know, some key considerations uh, in uh, our capital budget. Uh, you know, first, uh, the impact of COVID-19. Um, uh, for last year and this year, we have received record number of speeding and other public complaint requests. Um, we definitely have, uh, you know, a driver behavior issues uh, right now uh, going on. Uh, not just in the city, but also uh, nationally. Uh, you know, as we speak to our colleagues all over the country, uh, you know, we all seem to have this problem. Um, uh, you know, lots more speeding, um, and also people stay at home more, and so they, they notice more problem. So, uh, so they tend to uh, uh, tell us more about it and make requests and complaints. Um, we um, also uh, had to uh, respond to uh, COVID uh, uh, through different uh, uh, programs. Um, and uh, uh, because of that, and because of public increased public comments, uh, uh, complaints, we saw a lot of increased workload uh, for staff. Uh, but we did learn some very valuable lessons, uh, you know, for our infrastructure and for operations. Uh, I remember the mayor said, uh, you know, never waste a good crisis. So we're trying to uh, learn from it 
um, as we went through it. Uh, so some you know, lessons we want to really keep is uh, you know, to make the uh, infrastructure more flexible, uh, you know, such as like you know, share streets program uh, and how to make maybe make them permanent. And um, uh, you know, we want to design a more pedestrian fr uh, friendly uh, uh, infrastructure such as traffic signals. Um, and uh, we want to operate them in a way uh, that's more friendly for uh, pedestrians, bicycles, um, and uh, you know, for other operations. We also learned that uh, uh, we need to better uh, communications uh, to staff, and uh, uh, we need to build in some uh, uh, telework uh, flexibilities uh, for staff. Um, I also want to touch, you know. Uh, uh, very quickly on um, racial equity and social justice. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, with what we went through last year, uh, this is uh, on our mind more than ever before. Uh, that's definitely true at the traffic engineering. Uh, so we really trying to uh, you know, look deeply to see how we can improve on that. Uh, so we did some changes and, uh, you know, I want to share a success story, success story uh, our um, pedestrian bicycle enhancement projects that we collaborate uh, with uh, engineering uh, division. Uh, we actively reach out to uh, underserved neighborhoods, uh, you know, by being doing some very creative things, even like including going to, uh, you know, some community events um, and talk to them to see what they need and how can we help. Uh, so we've got a lot of really good uh, project ideas from that. And we also incorporate the equity considerations in the project prioritization process. So as a result, we were able to push out uh, many more projects in those neighborhoods, uh, and we were able to adequate resources uh, much more equitably. Um, and uh, you know, we have seen success on some of the uh, recent new programs and really want to build on uh, to them, uh, such as uh, uh, Vision Zero. Uh, you know, really put the safety first and also uh, uh, put the equity first. Um, we uh, had a lot of success with the citywide street LED conversion project. Uh, we're going to see, uh, even without uh, uh, it being fully uh, finished, we we'll start to see the benefits of that uh, savings um, uh, from electricity uh, use. Uh, so next year, we project to see $120,000 saving uh, from uh, electricity use alone. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, that's a you know, very good thing for sustainability. And we also reduce the burden uh, for low income neighborhood, neighborhoods to report outages. Uh, so uh, as IEDs have a much longer uh, lifespan. So that's also an equity improvement. Uh, another program that uh, we received a lot of feedback, uh, that's the Share Streets uh, program last year. We received uh, over a thousand uh, uh, survey responses. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, support our city to keep doing this. Uh, so we did uh, keep doing this uh, and we want to continue that. Uh, and also think about the newer program called Slow Streets uh, to really try to make things uh, a little bit more permanent. Um, and we also uh, propose some new program projects to respond to community, community needs, uh, as mentioned. Uh, again, Safe Streets Madison uh, really invest in safety for all road users and also closing some of the gaps in our back, uh, pedal bike uh, facilities. And the 20 is plenty. Uh, you know, we really hope that uh, uh, you know, better awareness on speed, how people drive, uh, drive and uh, um, um, drive at safe speed so that uh, even if a crash happens, uh, the consequences will be like much smaller. Uh, so we think that to really create a lasting impact on our neighborhoods and really promote a safety culture uh, in our community. Uh, and again, uh, uh, equipment uh, improvement for the field crew, uh, uh, it's very important to support them and improve, uh, help them improve efficiency. Uh, so, um, I, uh, with that, I thank you for your support to Traffic Engineering and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Yang. Now, I'm going to ask uh, President Abbas if you're there to take the chair for questions. Or, yep. 
Yes, Madam Mayor. Happy Thank you, to President Abbas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Alder Miyadze, question? Yes, I had a question, uh, Fatal. Uh, just wondering, uh, Willow Road right now is under construction. I'm just wondering, um, as far as safety-wise, people are using the uh, the bike path on Willow Road. Um, when is that project going to get done, um, the timeline? And what can you do to uh, address the safety concerns as far as um, bikes, um, the bike path on Willow Road? Uh, thank you, Aramirazi. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, actually, I think, uh, uh, you know, for the first part, uh, my colleagues with uh, city engineering might be, have a better information on that, on the schedule. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if any of them are still here. I'm wondering if Rob, uh, Chris, uh, you are here and uh, you have uh, the answer. Okay, uh, if not, um, uh, I'll sorry. find that out. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Yang, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the question. Um, so, Dr. Miyazi, you want to say that or say it again, or you want me to repeat that? Uh, I can say it again. Basically, okay, Willow, Ro Willow Road is under construction with uh, islands being put in. I'm just wondering, people right now are complaining that uh, the only way for them to get past is to use the uh, bike lanes. I'm wondering what we can do as far as safety-wise and also, when is the timeline for the project to be done? Um, I'll tell you what, I, I can get back to you on the timeline. I just don't have that, that in front of me. Um, usually, uh, we can handle these things uh, with our traffic control out there uh, to address uh, uh, the issues. I know uh, sometimes it's hard and sometimes... Uh, are these traffic circles, Yang, or are they traffic uh, uh, bumps? Uh, the, the great question, uh, Rob. I think a, uh, a combination of them. And okay. um, yeah, um, the information I got, I think from Rob's staff working on the, working with a contractor, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, I would think they're probably gonna be done in, you know, at most a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, again, I think maybe, you know, uh, Rob will uh, uh, have more information on that. Uh, so these are typically, these, these type of projects typically go uh, pretty quickly. And, um, uh, you know, regarding the uh, uh, potential safety issues of people, you know, getting by it and trying to use a, you know, use a bike lane, uh, uh, you know, we uh, will take a look. We haven't uh, received a lot of public uh, complaints on that. Uh, but we'll take a look. We'll work with the contractor uh, to make sure that we have proper traffic control, uh, and we provide adequate warning, uh, you know, for both uh, uh, bicyclists and and uh, uh, vehicles, uh, so that they can coexist, uh, you know, road safely, as uh, the crew uh, from the contractor is doing the construction. Yeah, if certainly, if you forward those to uh, a complaint like that to Yang or myself, uh, we'll. We'll address it immediately with our staff in the field. Uh, thank you. I uh, know that doesn't have too much to do with the budget, but just the questions as you guys are on call. So I appreciate it. Um, Madam Mayor, you're back. So I will give you back the control. Thank you. Thank you, President Abbas. Alder Wahalehe, questions for traffic engineering. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I just want to compliment Yang for his uh, leadership and how he incorporated racial equity and social justice into his budget. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Any other questions for traffic engineering? If not, thank you, Yang. Appreciate it. Uh, and we'll go on to transportation. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Lynch. I'm the Director of Transportation, uh, pronouns he and his. And we, uh, we have one project and two programs. <clears throat> uh, they're rather large ones. Um, first, we have the East-West Bus Rapid Transit. And uh, the city actually uh, received very good news in May of 2021. We were recommended by the USDOT for funding. Um, that was... Um, 
I'm going to say a little bit unsuspected. But oftentimes you have to, to wait and, uh, you know, it's, it's a process and it's a privilege to be able to be funded. Uh, the total project cost will be 166 million from 2018 to 2020. Uh, this is the year where we're appropriating um, our funds or the local match. And so the amount in this year's budget is $142 million, yet about 70% of that is federal monies. And um, my next slide will have a, a little bit more detail on that. Um, we also have the North-South Bus Rapid Transit funding. It's a new program with funding for design and environmental documentation in 2023. And that's $4 million. Uh, this is actually linked to that grant application that Justin um, uh, presented to you for about $900,000 um, in yesterday's discussion under the normal business of the Finance Committee. And so this would uh, prepare us um, to implement the north south portion of the bus rapid transit. Um, we're in the position where we're in right now in 2021 because advanced planning occurred in 2017 and 2018. And so what this uh, planning will do in 2023 will put us in a similar position so we can uh, capture those federal funds in, in perhaps 25 and 26. And then finally, um, <clears throat> we have a very small amount for inner city passenger rail station and corridor planning. Um, the mayor's office and, and transportation have been meeting with uh, Amtrak officials and uh, USD officials. And uh, the current budget proposals, federal budget proposals now have more for passenger rail than they have seen in a, in a very long time. And so uh, the opportunities for Madison to capture Ram Amtrak service is probably as great as it's ever been. And so what we'd like to do is make sure that we um, have adequate planning done on our, uh, our end so that we can kind of supplement those efforts and see if we can uh, take advantage of the, it looks like it's gonna be a considerable amount of federal funding for passenger rail. And can we be ready for it to uh, uh, go to Madison? Um, the next slide provides a little bit more detail on the bus, east-west bus rapid, transit. Um, the general obligation borrowing for the BRT project has actually decreased by $22 million this year from what was uh, projected last year. Uh, that's largely driven by the increased federal funding and uh, use of property as a local match for federal, federal grants. And so uh, the council, well, a couple of months ago, uh, approved the use of the Brayton lot and some engineering land over by Junction Road for use in the BRT project. And uh, that land counts as our part of our contribution. And so it greatly decreased how much uh, we have to contribute monetarily. Um, I kind of like colors, it helps me understand things. And so this is a color-coded pie chart. And so um, the federal represents about 70% and it's in blue, it's $117 million. Uh, different types and different funding federal pots, but it still represents 70%. Uh, the local borrowing is about $13 million and that's represented by uh, the orange. The local in kind is also represents $13 million and that's actually the, um, the property contribution that we're making towards the BRT that's counting as a local match. Uh, the local TIF contributions is uh, $20 million. Uh, half of that is cash. And half of that is borrowing, and that's associated with uh, TID 46, which is over by University Research Park, which um, is served a good deal by the bus rapid transit line. And then there's about $3 million of other types of funds, uh, some Rescue Act funds. Um, we also get to include debt service payments as part of our funding package, even though it, it comes out of a different part of the, the city's budget. And um, so that's the kind of the summary of the funding for the East West Bus Rapid Transit. I can take questions now. Thanks, Tom. Are there questions for transportation? 
Aldo Healy. Thanks, Tom, for the presentation. I'm wondering where does the uh, you talked about uh, one project and one program. Does State Street come into those programs or projects? Yeah. And where um, do, where does that come into the budget? Um. So, um, the BRT, uh, because there's multiple allocations over several years, those are termed as programs, okay? And then the, the project that's in my budget is actually for the, uh, the Amtrak, okay? uh, the Amtrak allocation. So, the, um, the East-West Bus Rapid Transit um, spans basically from Junction Road over to East Town, and it does use, um, goes along University Avenue, um, uh, Whitney Way, um, comes downtown. It uses two to three blocks of State Street, basically from the Johnson Gorm pair to the um, Capitol, and that is included in this budget request. North-South also line also while we do not have the, the lines identified for the north and south legs, the north and south portion would also use um, State Street. Any further questions, Alder? I might come back. Right. Alder Wahilahi, or excuse me, Alder Carter. Yes, Tom, do we know how much um, it's going to cost for operations of the BRT? Yeah, actually, because uh, the BRT is replacing uh, the local service that is already on these corridors, um, there, um, there probably will not be any net increase in operating costs. So what we're doing is we're we're replacing, let's say, four bus lines that might operate on Mineral Point Road and putting it into one bus line, the, the bus rapid transit. And so there, there is not anticipated to be any additional operating costs associated with BRT. And um, thank you for that. Would additional training need to be included for staff uh, with the BRT? Is that yeah, included? There will be additional training and safety certifications. And uh, uh, that's part of what uh, Justin Stuenberg does with his staff and his operations. Uh, he is online. He could perhaps answer that further if, um, if you'd like more detail on that. Yeah, and where would that be in the budget? Although no, that'll be in the operating budget. Operating budget, yeah. Okay, thank you. And I, one thing I would add is there there is a component of the capital budget, the BRT, that is startup costs. So part of that would cover some of the one-time training that you're talking about and you know marketing activities around teaching people how to ride the system and things like that. Um, those expenses can be capitalized and are inside the budget. Okay, so it'll be in, uh, appear in both uh, the capital and operating different ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, other President Abbas. Thank you. One quick question and one comment. So Tom, I saw, and I apologize if you already explained that, I saw this is a zero percent from Sun Prairie. Why it's zero percent? Well, it, it's not actually zero percent. It's 700,000 dollars um it shows up as zero percent because when you round it um seven hundred thousand um divided by 166 million i guess is closer to zero percent than one percent and so that's how the the excel graphic shows that so i that's misleading and so i apologize that it's misleading okay no, no that then that makes sense and, and thank you very much. Dividing all this transportation plan and future BRT and future study, while we are doing studies for BRT from North Side and the other plans are happening, I'm also just from a comment point of view really curious in future 
would counsel, it would be very nice for counsel to see also the carbon emission footprint report and see how much footprints gonna be improved carbon emission and around sustainability, a little bit information will be also really helpful to really track city sustainability goals as well. Yeah, that's actually a, a very good comment. Um, as you know, uh, the majority of the BRT buses will be electric. Uh, and, and we did do a, a little bit of analysis on, on that. Um, but it would be interesting to, um, to make that calculation and provide information to policymakers. So yep. Perhaps, Justin, you could bring it either to CCEC or Transportation Commission uh, with the other information. So, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate that. Thank you, President Abbas. Any other questions for transportation? Alder Revere. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Tom. Oh. I do have to ask a couple of questions about this little budget here. <laughs> Obviously, it's not very little considering it, uh, the BRT projects doubling our, our current year capital budget in its entirety. Uh, I realize that probably some of my questions and questions of stakeholders will likely be answered at this uh, public meeting that, that you're hosting on uh, September 29th. Uh, could you just, just so I can direct stakeholders to that meeting, could, could you or Justin share with us what exactly new will be shared at that public meeting in a couple of weeks that we haven't seen before? I know it's entitled 30% Project Design. Uh, could you go into a little more detail about that, please? I think there'll be, uh, um, we have a better understanding of exactly where the stations will be. Uh, we do have some computer generated graphics of what the stations will look like at different locations. Uh, we'll provide some um, some status as to the, the, the progress along uh, that. Um, those are the things that come to mind offhand. Justin, do you have more information on that? Yeah, essentially, this is our, you know, at our last public meeting, uh, we were at 10% design. So stations were just kind of blobs in a, in a certain intersection. Um, now we have actual, you know, locations and dimensions uh, with the proper lamp, ramp lengths and all of that so that we can have really a, a full two-dimensional view of the design of the system. Um, and, and this is our, uh, you know, design from, from this point forward is more in the three dimensions, making sure that um, drainage is correct and um, slopes are correct and all of that. Um, and so this, this will give us an opportunity to, to share the plans with everyone um, kind of in, in the full picture in that in two dimensions. Well, thank you both very much. Well, will the designs that you'll be sharing with us at that evening meeting be available on the BRT website in advance of the meeting, or do you know yet, or won't they be posted only following the meeting? Um, some of the information already is uh, is available. Like for instance, we do have some three dimensional renderings. Um, associated with uh, East Washington. I think there's one or two East Washington locations by East and then also by the, there's one in front of the, the Chazen and one on the Capitol Square. And so some of that information um, was just posted today on the BRT website associated with the, the 106 historic process. And so that the three-dimensional uh, renderings are available and we can, uh, Get the presentation up prior to the um, prior to the public meeting, probably a day or so, perhaps. Desired. Thank you. And I don't know if this is a document that already exists. If so, that that would be great. But I, it's been hard for me to get my hands around uh, trying to figure out what benchmarks. Uh, are needed to securing the small starts grant agreement. Obviously, the appropriation is critical as you've articulated and and ha ha have said in your budget agency budget request uh, that I've read. Is there is there a document or something that you plan to prepare that for policymakers and other interested parties 
as to what the next benchmarks are for the approval with the FTA for, for the small starts grant agreement and what the schedule is for that? Yeah. So there, there's really three main things. Uh, one, we, we have to appropriate our contribution, which in this conversation amounts to pretty much the local borrowing of 13 million and then the local TIF contributions. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is we have to have third party agreements in place. And so we're working with Wisconsin DOT on a third party agreement for the uh, East Washington. So we'll have agreements with Short Hills, uh, Dane County, perhaps with the university. And then the, um, the third thing is we have to have the environmental document approved. And so uh, and it's likely that uh, we're hoping that the um, that this will be included in the city budget, and this will be a, our commitment will be there. Uh, we anticipate that our third party agreements will be done close to the end of the year or early by early next year, and then the environmental document would be completed uh, March ish, you might say, of 2022, and that would allow us to uh, have a an agreement with the FTA and you know, start to negotiate that. So that, that would be ready perhaps around June of 2022. Now Justin's actually been through this process with the red line in Indigo. Uh, did I leave anything out, Justin? No, that was good. Um, the, the only thing I would add is obviously the, the federal government does have to pass a budget at some point uh, yeah. to um, which theoretically is supposed to happen at the end of this month, but as we all know, usually gets delayed for several months. So uh, that would be the last piece that needs to be complete. Do, do you have this in writing somewhere or could you put place to writing uh, what you just articulated, perhaps in a bit more detail? Um, Does such a document already exist somewhere? Well, it's, it's the document is quite long, you know, it's like the whole regulations, but it probably um, perhaps we could put together a next steps uh, summary that would be one page or something like that. And that, that would be um, perhaps of more use rather than guiding you to you know, federal guidance. It's you know, 300 pages long or something. Yeah, that would be most helpful. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> So, for example, a couple of other quick specifics in terms of next steps and, and the future schedule. So, as, as you know, there was a section 106, as you mentioned, historic, uh, um, that that's the, the historic uh, you know, review. Uh, that, as you know, this morning there was a section 106 consulting parties meeting that some downtown stakeholders attended. Is that, could you tell me where that historic review fits into the environmental review? and? Yeah, so um, Section 106 has to do with the state or the National Historic Preservation Law. And basically, um, any federal project, whether it's funded federally or has a federal permitting, um, has to assess its impact on properties that are eligible for the National Register. Um, and that, um, while it's a separate law, that law feeds into the environmental documentation. So going through the, the historic process and determining the effect and then um, of that uh, is a as an import into the environmental document. Does that help you? Or? And again, when the timing of that would be next year in terms of when that that would be finalized for submittal to the FTA? Well, um, I think right now what we're doing is uh, there was a discussion with consulting parties, okay? And then I think that will go before the Landmarks Commission in the next month. Then we will uh, submit a, uh, a packet um, of, our, you know, the, the area of potential effect, the historic properties, uh, the assessment of the impact. Uh, to the State Historic Society Preservation Office. Okay. And uh, they, I can't believe, can't remember if they have 45 days, but they have 45 days to respond. 
they agree or disagree. Um, if there is a no adverse effect or um, no mitigated no adverse effect, then we just move forward. If um, they feel like there's an adverse effect um, on historic integrity of these buildings, then we move into a consultation pro uh, process. And so um, the environmental dog, it's the 106 process is quite prescribed. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's one of the most prescribed processes within the whole NEPA construct or National Policy Environmental Policy Act construct. Um, but, it, you know, it's, a, it's actually, that's good because it's a very defined process. You go through it. Uh, when it's completed, that information gets put into the environmental document and then um, that can move forward. And thank you for mentioning the Landmarks Commission's role in this. Could, could you help us uh, understand what further approvals will be done on the municipal level? Obviously, the capital budget is critical, as we've talked about. Uh, so, for example, uh, as, as was you know the first question you addressed this evening uh, relating to stations and State Street, what is the approval process for the actual siting of each bus station and its physical location. You know, for example, you already you know mentioned in front of uh, the Amoka Museum uh, in your first response tonight, Tom. Does that go to 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 TC to um, TPPB? Where, where will where where will the actual approval process lie for each location uh, of each station within our organization? So the uh, the city uh, in January. Is it, please uh, excuse me. In March of 2019, the city um, approved a locally preferred alternative based on a document that showed the the stations, and um, in January of 2021. Um, the locally preferred alternative was refined a little bit for centers running and stations. Um, I believe that all of our uh, stations are relatively consistent with that approval right now. Um, if one is shifted, uh, if a transit station is shifted, um, that would go to TC. Um, in my mind, I am not sure if any have uh, shifted. Justin, do you recall if any have shifted from what was approved in January 2021? Not that I can think of. Yeah. So. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Alder, and yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I've, I've been fairly loose about this, but we are talking about the capital budget. Right, well, I'll wrap up with this, Mayor, thank you. The, so, and we can talk offline about this, Tom and Justin and any other interested parties, but I'll, I'll just say that that the the two common council approvals, and I'm not talking about changing the locally preferred route when I ask this, but obviously, as your honor announced in that press conference uh, this summer, the station locations have changed on State Street from what was in the original Common Council approval documents. If you look in Legistar, you know, those, those stations were frankly, you know, westbound was in a different block entirely. So you're saying those would go to TC, Tom and Justin, any modification like a block difference? Uh, when we move a, a transit stop, that goes to TC. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear the entire Yes, sentence. when we move a transit stop location that goes to Transportation Commission. And you see what I'm saying about the switch from the 200 block to the 300 block estate? Um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and you know, no rush, but it would be great as I just closing here if there was some sort of document that would help us with policymakers to understand, again, what benchmarks need to be achieved to securing that small starts grant agreement and the schedule both at the federal and I guess and state level but also uh, 
uh, locally beyond the, the capital budget adoption. Thank you. Thanks for your leeway, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. I will just remind us all again, though, we are here to ask and answer questions about the capital budget. Uh, are there any additional questions for transportation? Seeing none, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Justin, for popping in. Uh, and we will go to you next. All right, good evening, everyone. So uh, at Metro, uh, we have three main categories. Uh, one is our facility repair facilities and facilities and repairs and improvements. Um, that the primarily uh, the primary change in that category uh, was just changing the uh, the source of the funds. Um, in consultation with the finance department, uh, we identified um, some savings for the city from an interest perspective, or on the I'm sorry on the the levy limit perspective uh, by switching the funding source. Um, in practicality, it, it doesn't actually change how much money is spent and who is paying for it, just uh, as, a, um, as a clarification on the, the financing side. Um, for transit coaches, so our vehicle replacement, um, we have um, added $13.5 million in state funding for the Volkswagen settlement funds. Um, those are the funds, if you remember, um, we can apply for uh, the state administers um, and basically to purchase the upfront cost of buses uh, to replace it. old buses that uh, meet the definition of um, high polluting buses. So the old pre-2009 buses that, of which we still have several. We can use this fund um, to uh, replace those. Um, we do have to uh, pay a, a portion of that back um, over time um, to the state fund. However, we are researching uh, ways to, um, to change that through uh, some of our partnerships. Um, basically, we as Madison have to pay back 75%. Uh, other partners, um, other city or other entities throughout the state uh, may only have to pay back 10%. Um, and so uh, we did get clarification from our um, from the state that um, a partner could apply for these funds. And so, um, but uh, we've kept us in here um, to make the purchase and uh, we may be able to reduce some of the payback is all I'm saying. Um, and then we've, uh, so our BRT project is doing the bus replacement um, for the next three years. Um, and then in 2025, we plan to resume uh, bus replacement. Um, and we have increased the funding in 2025 and beyond to reflect the increased capital cost of electric vehicles. Um, and we're doing some work, um, and Alder Abbas referenced it, um, to develop a detailed plan for, for what that transition to electric looks like. Um, it's unfortunately not as, as simple as just switching over because the range still isn't there on some of these buses. And some of the manufacturers are, are fairly immature in, in building these buses. And so there's some production issues too that we need to work through. Um, but we are going to work on a, a plan and present that um, to various bodies uh, about that transition. And then the third category is transit system upgrades. Um, so we are proposing to um, include $7 million um, to split over four years. Um, for improvements that are intended to reduce our operating cost. Um, so we as at Metro have a, a structural operating deficit, which I'm sure many of you are aware of because our state funding and fair revenues aren't growing. Um, our costs are growing at you know, roughly 2%. Um, and so that means that our other funding sources, namely the city uh, and federal sources need to grow at 4%, which is not sustainable in the long term. And so um, these, um, these investments uh, are intended to, to slow our growth in operating cost. These could be things like solar panels and, and you know, various kind of very logical things, um, but they also could uh, include adding additional signals that would allow us to make a turn that right now we have to go around the block for. Um, those sorts of improvements can save us running time, can improve the transit service for everyone, and reduce our cost because we now maybe don't have to use one fewer bus on that route. Um, and so those are the types of improvements that would be targeted by this fund. 
we are uh, proposing $7 million again over the next four years. Um, and we're ostensibly using $7 million of federal rescue money um, to fund it. Um, but we're actually moving the federal rescue money into the BRT project and proposing local funds for these. Um, and that is, is really just a, a realization that many of these small projects are very difficult to achieve with federal money. Um, it's the reason we don't use federal money on bus shelters anymore, uh, because often the environmental review costs more than the bus shelter. Um, and so uh, we're trying to be uh, good stewards of dollars here and, and, and focus our federal money on the, the big ticket projects that already go through that environmental process. So, um, if you go to the next one, uh, I've already talked through most of this, uh, some of these things, but um, as far as our um, our Rescue Act dollars that we've received in response to COVID-19, uh, the plan is to use most of them to uh, recover our lost fare revenue um, and to replace some of our federal formula funds for preventative maintenance. So we, we typically use about $6 million in federal money in preventative maintenance. Um, and so we'll be using COVID relief funds for that instead. Um, and then using some um, for capital improvements, namely our technology project and this um, some of it to going to BRT uh, with the intent of freeing up dollars for the uh, with the other operational cost savings that I just mentioned. Um, and uh, the last couple of things I'll note, the facility upgrades um, that we're planning um, are, are critical to continuing to, to meet our needs. Um, we are going through um, our fourth um, phase of renovation at, a, at our 1101 East Washington facility. Right now, we have one more major phase to go, planned for 2023. Um, and then we just purchased our uh, facility on Hanson Road, at Fed, the old FedEx facility. Um, and we're working towards a design for that to, to make the minor renovations that are needed for it. So uh, all those are, are critical for us to continue operations. Um, you know, those, those improvements have been badly needed for a very long time. Um, and then just a reminder, bus replacements, um, that is a, a revolving expense. Uh, you know, we typically try to replace 15 buses every year. Uh, that keeps our fleet generally within their useful life or near it um, and, and keeps our maintenance costs under control. Um, if we do allow our buses to go 20 years, um, they, they, we spend an awful lot of money uh, trying to keep them on the street, which is uh, a, a, not a great use of operating dollars. That's it for me. Thank you, Justin. Are there questions for Metro? Not seeing any questions for Metro. So thank you very much, Justin. Uh, and that takes us to uh, fleet services. All right, thank you all. I wanted to thank uh, the Finance Committee, Finance Department, uh, the Mayor's Office, and uh, my team at Fleet for helping us get through uh, another capital budget year. Uh, just on a high level, I wanted to talk about what we've done with capital the last few years. Um, we've been able to build a really nice uh, automotive shop. It's actually one of the most uh, sustainable in the country. And we are finally getting our fleet to where it want to be, want, we want it to be, which is also one of the most uh, environmentally friendly, sustainable fleets. Um, so we promised last year we'd get to over 100 hybrid vehicles and over 60 electric vehicles. Uh, we've gotten there. Uh, we want to keep going in the coming years. Uh, and there's a lot of exciting new types of vehicles coming online, including uh, electric garbage trucks, electric pickup trucks, uh, electric semi truck. We already have one on order, which we should be seeing hopefully early in 2022. Uh, and we're also operating the only uh, electric fire truck in North America, uh, thanks to a partnership with the fire department and Pierce Manufacturing. Uh, and we want to keep that going. So we're asking for a little more money on electric, heavy trucking and infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure is a heavy lift. Uh, this involves actually modifying exi existing city buildings, which are often old, um, to accommodate uh, charging for trucks, uh, which is a much larger amount of charging than we take for our cars. Um, what we call level two, which is what we use for our cars uh, that you might see uh, in the CCB or in the Wilson Street ramp or some of our other facilities. That's not as heavy a lift. And uh, we're getting a lot of support from the private sector 
on this, including MG&E, which is helping fund the infrastructure. Uh, so the money we're asking for here is for the vehicles themselves, as well as some of the costs associated with the infrastructure um, installations. Uh, we also have money for the fire apparatus, um, as we do every year. And uh, finally, the rest of the, the funds would be for our regular vehicle replacements. In every case, we are looking for the most environmentally sustainable possible option that includes parking utility and all of our other partner agencies who are really working well with us. Um, I've got to give a shout out to all the partner agencies who are kind of taking these risks with us while we make sure that they fulfill their frontline operations as well. Okay, so a few of the highlights we'll talk about. Um, we are seeing a problem with acquisitions due to um, COVID supply chain disruption. There's also a semiconductor disruption globally, which is slowing down the vehicles um, coming off the factory lines and getting to us. Uh, so we're seeing delays. Um, we expect that to continue next year, unfortunately. Uh, we have worked on a right-sizing project um, with our partner agencies. We're actually reducing our fleet size. This is the first time uh, since I've been here, I've been here for four years, that we're actually reducing the number of vehicles we're running while still fulfilling the mission. This will help us save money on maintenance and fuel. It'll also increase our auction revenue. Uh, so that's part of our uh, plans to save both capital and operating costs in future years. Uh, so I mentioned uh, greening the fleet, especially with electric and hybrid. Uh, we're also investing in biodiesel um, quite heavily, and we're getting a lot of private funding to upgrade our biodiesel uh, facilities and to increase the amount of biodiesel we can use. Uh, thanks to these efforts, uh, we're approaching 7 million pounds since 2018 alone on CO2 reduction. And that's a number we're going to keep attacking every day with every dollar we get of capital. Uh, and all with all the new equipment we're getting, we are going to spend it carefully uh, with the goal of reducing further our CO2 footprint and to beat our goals for this decade um, early, if we can. And finally, uh, consolidating four facilities around the city into the single headquarters uh, that we have, which is at Nakusa Trail, uh, is resulting in a lot of savings for us, efficiency for our customers to get better service in one place uh, with the radio shop all also there. And uh, fuel savings, we're driving less back and forth, which is something that's important as part of our strategy is not just getting the equipment and infrastructure, but just driving less miles uh, where possible. And that really takes all of us. And uh, I would welcome anyone on this call who hasn't yet seen Nakusa Trail to come check it out. And I'll give you a personal tour anytime uh, that you're available. And then I'd just like to make a, a side comment. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot this week about 9-11. Uh, unfortunately, I was there you know, in New York and we lost a lot of uh, courageous city employees that day, some of whom I knew. And I can't think of a better way for all of us to honor what happened that day than to wean our fleet off of fossil fuels for good. And I hope we'll get there this decade with your help. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Mahant. Are there questions for fleet? President Abbas. Well, Mahant, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, no question, just a comment. Kudos to you and your department and all the other departments who are working with you on electrifying our fleet and also improving their efficiency. So thanks, thanks for your leadership. Thank you. And I appreciate the support from the council in uh, the budget process, as well as many other things. So thank you as well. Uh, and we have a long way to go. So thanks for the kudos, but I just see the path ahead and all the work we have to do, but I'm very confident in where we are. Alder Revere. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, hi, Mahath, and, and very well said remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you're very passionate about sustainability, and it showed from the first day we met you uh, when you had your confirmation hearing, and you certainly are living uh, the promise that you made to us four years ago. Uh, so uh, yesterday, I don't know if you watched our capital budget hearing yesterday, but, but Chief Davis was asked uh, about the CARES van uh, possibly becoming an EV uh, vehicle in the future. And that got me to thinking, and I know in prior uh, budget hearings that I've often asked about the fire department replacement vehicles. Can you, can you speak a little about uh, how the uh, 
Pierce Volterra, and it was great seeing that that's one of the photos on our budget book this year for for the 2022 capital budget. But anyway, can you can you speak to how the performance of Engine Eight, or as some firefighters I know call it Electric Eight, is going, and remind us what is our agreement with Pierce? How how long do we have it as part of their evaluation? Yeah, thank you, Alder Revere. So a couple things. The first thing, uh, the CARES van that's being used right now is a plug-in hybrid van. Uh, what that means is uh, we plug it in and get 30 miles on the electric battery alone. Um, and then it switches over to a gasoline engine. Um, so that's a hybrid. Um, we've been using that before the CARES program for out-of-town trips, and that's on loan to the CARES program. We're looking for a more permanent solution for the CARES program which I hope will be electric, um, completely electric, uh, hopefully next year with this budget, actually, in 2022, um, as we see more uh, vans come online that are electric. Uh, and then the Volterra, I believe, is working great. Um, that's what I'm hearing from the firefighters and the fire department uh, and the chiefs over there. Uh, it's at Station 8. It's been there since May 21st. Um, I haven't seen it in the shop much, to be honest. So I think it's out there working. It's had a few minor issues. We're getting a lot of uh, TLC with uh, Pierce, which is a Wisconsin company. So I'm really proud that um, this was made in Wisconsin, just up the road in Appleton. Uh, as far as the agreement with Pierce, uh, we've been operating uh, Pierce trucks for all of our fire truck needs for uh, decades now. And in 2020, we just uh, renewed that agreement for another five years. Um, and the Volterra, I hope, is part of those plans. I hope we keep buying Volteras. And I know it's generated a lot of interest around the country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the clarification on the CARES van. Yes, the, Steve did say yesterday that, that it was hybrid. Uh, so, so we did hear that yesterday. Uh, um, so any, uh, as it relates to, to Volterra, maybe I misunderstood. I thought that it was almost kind of a loner vehicle because we were um, kind of testing it and evaluating it in conjunction with Pierce for Pierce. Is that correct? Or, or do, we, do we actually own that uh, now forever, the, yeah. the engine made elect Volterra? That's a really good point you brought up. So it is a no cost uh, loan to the city. It's on an indefinite loan because it's a prototype. So it's the only one in existence. And typically um, from getting, a manufacturer to make a prototype into making a mass produced vehicle takes several years. Uh, so we anticipate it'll be with us for a while. Uh, there's no end date to that agreement. Um, what we're providing as a city is having real firefighters go to real scenes and put it through the motions. And um, they're responding to a lot of, um, a lot of different incidents with it uh, successfully. We're saving a lot of diesel, a lot of emissions with it. And we're providing data um, for Pierce and for ourselves. Uh, with our careful tracking of how it's being used. So you brought up a great point. We don't own that at the moment. Right now, it's on a an indefinite loan for us. Yeah, thank, thank you. And then, you know, specifically, as it can, talking about the fire apparatus, I, I know in the, in the executive budget, uh, there is a slight typo, but just to read the sentence, it says funding in 2019, so that's the typo, will be used to purchase seven vehicles, including two ambulances and one ladder truck. Uh, do you know, uh, Mahath, of those, those remaining vehicles, is it, or will some of them be EVs uh, for fire continuing this trend? Obviously, the, the ladder truck won't be, and I don't know if, if it's possible to uh, have ambulances that are uh, electric yet in, in, in America. Yes, another great question. We are kind of, uh, what's the word? We're bugging all of our contacts uh, in the industry, including our ambulance suppliers about uh, getting electric options and that we're very interested and we're, you know, I wanna try to buy them yesterday, to be honest. Uh, but uh, no, we don't have that option yet for the rest of the fire apparatus. Um, we have Tyson Ressler on the call. He does all of our purchasing. Uh, Tyson, can you confirm that? That's true. We're, we're looking everywhere we can um, with all the manufacturers to get um, anything hybrid or electric. We, we, we source that as much as we, as much as possible. So. Yeah. So I think ambulances, you're going to see us able to do that in the next one to two years. 
That's along, great. Along with vans and pickups and other types of medium duty uh, vehicles. Of, of these, th thank you, and, and Tyson, uh, of these remaining fire vehicles that are mentioned in the executive capital budget for plan for next year, are the other ones like uh, um, Chief's uh, personal, I don't want to call them personal, but anyway, the Chief's cars and that sort of thing, and and those are going to be EV or are EV? Uh, the, the two command cars that we have are hybrid um, Ford Interceptor vehicles. So at, at this point, um, that's the vehicle um, that we've chosen and they've worked really well. We don't have a fully electric SUV yet that is rated, um, but those are a good option. Thank you. As far as the budget for this coming year, the target vehicle to be fully electric might be the mini ambulance. That might be a good target one. Oh, so is one of the in the in the budget book, it doesn't give that detail as one of the seven vehicles planned, the one of the mini ambulance that we I know we have one of already. Correct. We have a, a earmark for um for funding the mini ambulance in 2022. I see. Is it a replacement or it'll be a second one in our fleet? That would be a replacement, yes. Oh, very good. Okay. Well, again, thank you both very much, especially uh, uh, your commitment to sustainability, as I said earlier. appreciate all the information and all you do. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Alder. Thank you. Uh, other questions for fleet? If not, thank you, Mahanth and Tyson both. Uh, and we'll go on to the streets department. Excuse me, Streets Division. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, Charlie Romines with Streets. And as the first depart uh, division to go behind Mahant, I can certainly attest wearing us out on electric vehicles and alter <laughs> alternate fuel um, uh, in a good way. We're, we're, in fact, the 16 vehicles the city is doing the B100 pilot are all uh, Streets vehicles coming up, including um very nervously a plow truck so that's going to be fun uh for this winter um <clears throat> on with the show uh so for the streets division the major uh changes to highlight of course is the uh above the fold uh headline of the far west maintenance facility which some may also know as south point um out off of south point road just west of cardinal glen park um that's uh, moved off the horizon list and put into the SIP. Um, we also have on the streets equipment, uh, the budget uh, has been increased um, and that's primarily being driven. We actually lowered um, the apples to apples comparison for 22 and 23, but when you add back in the cost of um, getting the equipment we need to service the town, including $100,000 just in garbage and recycling carts, um, it wound up as a net increase that you see there. And then uh, we're looking at making some yard improvements that we'll talk about in the next slide, which while it changed, does not, uh, was not an increase in the overall SIP. Um, so for South Point, I think it's important to understand a few things. Um, obviously, since South Point was Re, re reimagined a few years ago, uh, forestry moved over to the streets division. However, it had always been the intention, at least in my uh, three and a half years in streets that forestry would be offered co-location there, as well as the parks division. And also there will be a satellite fleet garage in the location. So that will come in quite handy for police fire, uh, especially for uh, those, uh, those stations and Firehouses on the west side of town not have to, to travel to the east side as often. Um, so there should be good uh, efficiencies and savings there. Another point I think I'd like to make that I think is not always immediately understood is this facility won't just benefit far west residents. Um, for those that don't know, Badger Road, which is just off of Fitch Hashery, um, currently services the city from roughly Park Street all the way out to Middleton. Um, 
So it is a long reach and getting longer all the time. If you haven't been out west of Junction Road and seen all the construction that can that it continues out there, it's quite mind boggling. So by adding this facility, what it will allow us to do is really bring Badger Road into more of a central streets and Sycamore more of an east streets. And then when you look at the eventual build out of the city, the streets and forestry division will actually be very well located to service the city for forever. I mean, three really great uh, locations to serve from. Um, should, uh, well, conservatively mean 100,000 fewer miles traveled a year um, just from streets. And that's a conservative estimate to say nothing of forestry, parks, etc. cetera. Uh, the public drop-off improvements. Um, one of the things we're looking at doing right away is putting in two electric compactors right now uh, for the trash that comes into the drop-off site, we actually have rear loading compactors that, that have to idle. Um, and we, uh, we estimated we're burning about 4,000 gallons of fuel, diesel fuel a year with those. Um, and so by, take, by removing those, uh, that will be a, a real savings. And you can do the math there kind of on a real payback uh, without even calculating the environmental benefits of bringing those electric compactors in and taking the uh, diesel burning rear loaders out of the yards. Uh, and that's something that uh, we will likely look to replicate in a few years when the uh, centrally located drop off site gets settled, which to speak of the devil. Uh, we are currently, if you don't know, our centrally located drop off site in the city is at the Badger Road yard. Um, it is very tight, getting tighter all of the time. Um, and we even have people trying to drop things off during snow events. And occasionally I will close that uh, drop off location during snow events. We actually have times when our plow trucks uh, get caught up in the traffic of people still trying to use the drop off sites during certain snow events. So um, this in combination with the project um, that's also mentioned here in the narrative, which is um, we're going to move the drop off site next year out to South Point. Uh, so there will not be a centrally located drop-off location. Reason for that being is we're putting in a new salt and storage barn. The reason that the timing of this and the where it's currently situated in the SIP works nicely is we will be able to design that with the understanding that that drop-off site won't be coming back to Badger. It will be going over to the Olin Avenue, which is also very centrally located, convenient to the Beltline, convenient to the Isthmus and the current area it serves. So the idea is that it will go out to South Point for likely two seasons, come back uh, to the Olin Avenue location. Um, that will allow us to make that um, central drop-off location larger and make the traffic flows much, much safer and should uh, greatly improve the customer experience um, with our centrally located uh, drop-off site, as well as dealing with the, some of the environmental drop drawbacks of having above ground fuel tanks right next to storm inlets. Um, so with that, uh, the only other thing I would mention, because I don't like reading slides, is the town of Madison. We did have some unavoidable costs. We, we shrunk our SIP where we could, particularly as it related to equipment, to try to help offset the blow, but buying the trash and recycling carts is unavoidable and having a couple pieces of equipment to service, you know, the 5,000 residents coming in next Halloween um, was just something that that we needed. So I'm um, happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Charlie. Are there questions for streets? Not seeing any questions for streets. So thank you, Charlie. And we are on to the water utility. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I have a couple of slides uh, to share with you. The first slide is a summary of our six-year capital improvement project uh, that was presented to you for a total of $61.5 million dollars. Essentially, we have water main programs, the bulk of it, and uh, major facilities, um, $17.2 million, and the rest is facility and fleet improvements. Our challenge, though, is on the funding source side of it. 
how do you line up the 61.5 million dollars in the next 6 years so the three options that we have the first one that you see up there is called the expense depreciation that's a way to seek psc approval to include an increased amount of depreciation as a way of funding our capital infrastructure hopefully we'll get a authorization for up to 33 to 35 million dollars when we go before the psc in the next uh, in december and the second component of funding will consist of a low interest loan for about 20 million dollars and we have about 8 million dollars 7.7 million dollars in cash so that's the expenditure side and the funding sources for our six year program next slide please we'll zoom into the 2022 uh, capital budget request for 8.6 million dollars um our programs are listed on the left side of the slide uh, with water main programs uh, 3.6 million dollars and pipeline projects associated with major street improvements amounts to about 1.4 million dollars meter program and others about 1.3 and we have a well uh, well filtration program to be put in place for about 900,000 dollars uh, for a total of 8.6 million dollars so the other important aspect of 2022 is we have uh, at the beginning of this year about 12.4 million dollars in borrowed funds we will extend uh, we will reduce it to about 7.7 at the end of this year and at the end of 2022 we would essentially be spending all of our borrowed funds and we will not we are not planning to borrow for the next 5 years that's why those other three sources were listed um no uh, no revenue bond funding for the next 5 years at least to reduce our debt load we have a third slide um let's see if we can get there this is a visual representation of all the major projects that we are planning for 2022 in case you have questions we can you can base it off that picture as well i'll be glad to take any questions you may have thank you krishna are there questions for water not seeing any questions appreciate the map uh all right with no questions for water then we'll move on to parks thank you krishna good evening everyone uh my name is eric nap i'm the parks superintendent for the parks division uh here to present on the 2022 executive capital budget and corresponding 2023 to 2027 capital improvement program for the division. Um the uh overarching division's plan or budget includes seven main major projects and 11 uh main programs. Those programs are um an accumulation of a massive amount of projects scattered across the city of a little smaller uh, scope generally uh but meeting infrastructure needs uh, across um across the entire system. the adjustments from the 2021 adopted capital budget and corresponding uh CIP are modest in comparison to 2022 uh there is shifting between major uh areas or programs uh, that's relatively routine as the evolving landscape of prioritization and project estimates uh come together with um establishing the work plans uh specifically over the next 2 years you know we we have the 6 year window of the program and then we have that two year window forward looking that's assigning staff um dedicate you know coming up with a solid very very solid project estimates and the like and so some of those shifts between project our program but budgets are going down a little up a little is attributable to that and some is also some change in prioritization our prioritization across um the entirety of the um budget is is rooted on Uh, on and in equity our, our sustainability goals our accessibility goals and also um to a very heavy extent um addressing aging infrastructure that's currently in place um the executive um uh, capital budget modifications uh, included in the executive budget from prior years um does include some modification of funding and timing for uh, implementation of the James Madison uh Vilas and McPike Park master plans as highlighted on the slide so we can go to the next slide please 
Um, as referenced, uh, we, we spent a lot of time identifying sa- ever-changing safety and accessibility concerns across our system and working to address those as, with a priority. Uh, failing infrastructure or deferred maintenance um, is also um, a significant part of our work. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, uh, a large part of our park system and its uh, infrastructure was built in the 60s to early 80s. Uh, that includes buildings and parking lots as much as we don't like them, we need them. And um, they are they are failing at a fairly high rate. The pandemic was certainly a, a major change for us in parks and as far as how we operated, but also uh, a reminder of how important we were as uh, the commons for just a massively diverse array of uses from the public. And we've seen over time how um, people are coming out of the pandemic or through the pandemic in different uh, levels of risk and interest and returning to the culture and character type uh, events and others still that um, solitary walk and enjoying the park with close family. The, um, the, the uh, major priority projects in the, the, the budget for 2022, the actual capital budget for next year, that are focused on uh, providing additional services to underrepresented groups uh, include the Elver, the Elver Park work to establish and actually restore a second cricket pitch. Uh, we listed field here. I know it's a pitch, everyone, uh, but the, a, second, uh, a second cricket pitch pitch. Uh, we used to have two, for those who don't know, we had two. We had one at Bill Kettlefield uh, a few years ago now, about eight years ago. Uh, we sold Bill Kettlefield to the county for uh, landfill expansion, a necessary thing for our uh, community. And we committed to the cricket players at the time we were going to work to find another location. We haven't done that yet, or we haven't built it yet, but we do think that Elver is a logical place uh, for that. The Olin Park facility improvements. We're really excited to be partnering with uh, MMSD and MSCR, our community programming partner. Uh, We think um, at this time next year, we will have um, programming in the building and uh, in a centrally located, uh, you know, uh, civic presence in a a new way on the south side of Madison, or at least south south facing, uh, which is very exciting. At Penn Park, we're working on, we've done uh, a lot of work on the shelter, um, rehabilitation, new restrooms, new playground, and path work. Uh, we're now excited to be having are having funding in place to work on court improvements, the basketball courts. We still have a tennis court there that's pretty low level of utilization, and um, we have a lot of those tennis courts in the system, we know. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, re- rehabbing and improving the basketball courts, as well as uh, adding our first, our first official futsal court. And Gaga Ball is an addition uh, there as well. Uh, Rindell Park, uh, we do have um, budgeted uh, a plan for a, a new uh, and our first two Lou Court, uh, which would be the first one in the city. Uh, it's a uh, really quite a fun game. Um, I enjoyed a, a lot in, in the Hmong community. Uh, Renabon Park and Warner Park, we have our third and fourth fully accessible playgrounds budgeted for construction next year. Um, this is um, an important. Uh, amenity. We get a lot of positive feedback from the community on the two at Brittingham and Elver currently, and we're excited to work with the Park Foundation, who will be contributing three hundred thousand dollars towards those two projects. And then finally, um, we have the Warner Park new pedestrian bridge to connect better to Brentwood, uh, as well as the design work on the WPCRC uh, facility expansion. Well, uh, the balance, the majority of our projects are. Uh, funded in some way, shape, and form in combination between uh, general obligation borrowing and park impact impact fees to the extent practicable. And um, as always, I try to note that the long-term reliance on impact fees for uh, in investment is not highly predictable and, and, and may not be long-term sustainable uh, for, the, for the division. And um, then, of course, many of the projects do have operational impacts that will, will require additional operational support. It says levy support, but we got to find a way to uh, support those uh, ongoing maintenance costs. Next slide, please. And the, the last slide here is really just to kind of talk a little about how we get new projects in the book, on the books, and, and into the um, into the hopper, if you will, and also to kind of break down a little about what the where the funding goes in in 
in our 2022 SIP. And as you'll, you'll see, the majority is maintenance projects. That's also deferred maintenance or aging infrastructure, replacing of like with somewhat like, if you will, there's uh, new amenity projects and land acquisition. And then obviously uh, the Warner Park Community Rec Center expansion is a significant important and significantly sized project in our in our budget as well. You will see the remaining hanging on the last little bit of EAB program funding as we transition away from capital funding for EAB work. With that, I am uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eric. Are there questions for Parks? No questions for Parks? Alder Revere. Thank you, Mayor. Eric knows you can count on me. So, Eric, this is, I think, the earliest you've ever been up at a capital budget here, and congratulations. We're making really record-efficient time this week, so uh, I'll try not to filibuster with all my questions. Uh, admittedly, I'm going to ask you uh, about three parochial projects downtown, but perhaps um, some of the themes would be helpful to all of my colleagues uh, in the meeting. Uh, so you can probably guess pretty easily what those three downtown projects are and some aren't just downtown, but anyway, uh, they're projects that have been around for many years now. In fact, um, Steph Mabry and, and Betsy York probably can guess what they are just as well as you could, but I'll, I'll just jump right into them. The, the issue is um, for me that I have, stakeholders, constituents that regularly ask me about, uh, uh, in no particular order, the um, <clears throat> Lake Monona waterfront improvements, as we're calling them now in the executive capital budget, the potential siting for a new downtown park, and third and lastly, uh, improvements to the Madison Senior Center courtyard and conversion to an official city park. And the issue is that uh, our, our budget book presentation has never allowed for um, folks to, to easily see that indeed there are um, monies available that were appropriated in prior year appropriations. Uh, you know, the budget presentation does not allow for um, anybody to, to see what the remaining budget authority is for these projects. So, you know, kind of taking them perhaps in the order that I just articulated them to you as it relates to the Lake Monona waterfront improvement project. Do you by chance have in front of you approximately, and if not, certainly you and, and finance staff can get that to me at a later date, but what the remaining budget authority is for the, that project, uh, you know, cause we made some significant appropriations you recall back in 2018 and 20. 19. Oh, absolutely. And that's a great question, Alder Verbeer. And um, I'm starting to almost fully transition, I think, away from being the the, uh, the numbers guy uh, in parks. Thank goodness, because we have much more talented staff. So on that question, I'm going to ask Mike Sturm or January Vang if either one of them have that number handy. If not, uh, we will get it to you. I will tell you it is significant. Um uh, a significant amount of resources remain and project work is continuing and uh, on the Lake Monona waterfront and tied together. I won't go into the great detail. Mike could do that as far as tied together very nicely, I think with, um, with the project for the John Nolan drive reconstruction. January is telling me that we will likely have to get you the exact number, but I know it's significant. It's a significant amount of resources remain to come to work towards a master plan. I appreciate that. And, and I anticipated that, that was the case. Again, I realize this is a budget presentation issue and perhaps the activists on the Friends of Nolan Waterfront Board now realize that uh, and they appreciate the fact that this is no longer partially on the horizon list as it was uh, proposed a year ago. But, um, you know, if you read the, the description here, folks would have no idea that we're making progress and we're planning a design challenge uh, probably a worldwide, perhaps, design challenge in the in the next year. Uh, Mike, since you are with us, do you mind just giving a couple sentence update on where we are with this major project, which affects several aldermanic districts 
um, physically and the whole community uh, and and speak to the design challenge. I, I'll also say, as maybe Mike, you're thinking about your response since the since the budget book doesn't uh, help folks with remaining budget authority and give a true sense of where projects are perhaps. Uh, and again, using the parks division as an example, one tactic that I've used is sending a link to the Madison City Channel uh, videos of these colloquies so that I can, you know, share with folks what what the what the staff is saying real time here, uh, in terms of where we are with these projects. So no pressure, Mike, but but I might be sending the link to this to to those that are that are very uh, interested. Certainly, certainly, and, and we've been communicating with the with the friends group and other project stakeholders um, over the duration of the project. So um, to start with, I think to answer your first question, we have I just quickly was able to get into Munis and just double check my, my numbers, but we have roughly 330K remaining on a previous authority, funding authority for the project. So, and that we, you know, looking forward, that will likely be sufficient to hold the design challenge. Now there's additional um, funding requests in built into the SIP now, which you which you have before you. So you're aware of those. And, and I think one of the key components here too is that we've, we've allocated construction funding in 2026 to coordinate with the reconstruction of the causeway. So whatever improvements that come out of this planning effort, um, we have construction funding available. We often are running into situations where we, we do engagement, outreach, we create a vision, we produce plans, but then we it's a hard time getting the, the actual construction funding behind that. So we're trying to avoid that situation with the Lake Winona waterfront, in particular for the causeway improvements. So um, earlier this year, we completed um, the law, it, Lake Winona waterfront preliminary report. So this was a two year effort uh, as far as community engagement, um, site analysis and inventory. Um, it's a pretty robust document. It's about 130 pages without, without the appendices. Um, and that document is going to serve as the basis for the design challenge. So um, what's been communicated to this point um, with um, stakeholders um, is that we are going to be introducing a resolution later this year to the council that outlines the design challenge process. We recognize that there's multiple city agencies involved, there's multiple um, other districts involved. It is really um, the city's waterfront. And this is something that we want to ensure that all policymakers have a, a, an opportunity to weigh in on. So we are gonna be outlining what that design challenge looks like. We're gonna be working closely with um, city purchasing. There's purchasing requirements that we kind of have to navigate as well as how are we, how are we issuing stipends to um, challenge participants, and then also how is this going to be brought, how are we going to um, uh, promote this, this endeavor? So I think that there's um, still a lot of pieces that are, are getting lined up. We're doing some case studies. We're, we're looking at what will work for Madison. Um, and and Alder Revere, I think you likely can appreciate this as well, is, is that, um, so a lot of, a lot of the, the studies that we have looked at or the, the, the case examples, um, it's really, a, a design challenge or design competition is often the other the other way it's phrased is that there is a jury right and the jury is made up of individuals and the jury reviews the submissions and then the jury awards the um, the the the, the, um, the preferred the preferred final you know um, design the parks divisions process for master plan development doesn't fit that model. Um, we have a reoccurring process where we develop concepts. We go back to the back to neighbors and stakeholders and park users. We make refinements, then we come back and back. And it's a circular rising process that ultimately leads to the final master plan for the park. So we're trying to find a, an appropriate balance where we can get we can get the the national attention for the waterfront development. But we're also still kind of having that level that that granular level of engagement by park neighbors, park users, um, neighborhood associations, stakeholder groups. Um, so that we're, that's that's the kind of the challenge that we're facing right now. And we intend to map that out in this resolution, issue it later this year to the council or introduce it, pardon me. Um, and, then, and then ultimately hold this, um, hold this design challenge in 2022. So that's kind of where we're at. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate your your detailed update there. And and just finally on that, I, I, I am thinking that perhaps I'm going to ask Steph 
to draft an amendment that might add some clarifying narrative language for this project as, as she generously did last year, you might remember, uh, just so that uh, stakeholders are aware that, that work is progressing, that there will be a design challenge anticipated this next budget year, uh, and as opposed to the budget presentation, which implies that perhaps work isn't occurring again until 2024 when you look at the, the SIP. So, so thank you for that. I'll just move on to, to land acquisition then next. And, and Eric, obviously, and Mike, both of you have, have been with me on this journey for many years now. For, for my colleagues that aren't aware, the core downtown of our community is by far under uh, all, all measurements, the most parked efficient part of the city uh, based on the densities, the significant densities we have downtown. And, and as we're going through the redistricting process now, just looking at the tremendous growth downtown in the last 10 years between uh, the census is, uh, is a great recent illustration of that. So as it relates to, to the land acquisition, Eric, uh, can you just confirm that, that what we see uh, in, in the executive budget is a, a good estimate as to where things stand today uh, with the amount of what the, the current balance is for for that fund for the land act for for land acquisition dollars correct yeah um, I'm sorry I'm waiting on January uh, it's going to be north of 10 million dollars um, I don't have the number exactly on the top off the top of my head I apologize all to prepare well that's okay so if, if you uh, and, the, and we have uh, go ahead I'm we can I was going to say, we can get you an exact number probably here in a few moments. I should have had that coming into this meeting. I should have known that that question would come, but it it is healthy. Um, it is significant. And we have currently, I think, one immediate acquisition. My hope is immediate acquisition coming yet this year. Um, that will be, you know, in the, in the low, um, you know, couple million dollar range. Um, I can say that the the priority acquisitions, both on the the west side, um, the southwest side, uh, perhaps, and then um, a downtown park, should they be available and the target um, meet the, the the needs, I think we are in a position to close on on either one of those or actually both um, in the coming years. Uh, January tells me that <clears throat> available right now is right about thirteen point eight million. Thirteen point eight million. Thank you. I'm looking at page one ninety seven for my colleagues' benefit. Page one. Sorry, are you on the impact fees? I haven't looked at the impact fees. No, I'm looking at the parkland impact fees on page one ninety seven. Gotcha. That that's the same fund that, that you in January are referring to. Is that correct? Well, there are two funds. Let me make sure I'm looking at the right one. There because there's still the residual fund as well. I apologize, Alder. I don't have an actual budget book before me like I used to. Um, that's not a knock on anybody. I just don't. <laughs> um, I'm serious. <laughs> it's just, I'm trying to go for it. <laughs> uh, and I'm not very good at it. Um, save the so, trees, people. Yep. No, I'm with you, Mayor. Absolutely. Let's save the trees. But uh, I got to open that link. But the, there are two funds. I'm, I forget exactly how they're presented in the budget book. <laughs> executive budget get that to open uh, but there are two there's still the old one from the prior impact fee authorization uh, uh alder revere and then there's the the newer one that was established with uh, the new impact fees in, in position and so if you look on uh, see i don't they don't have the page numbers uh, one of them is has a balance of about shows in the budget five hundred forty eight thousand dollars. That's the old one. Yeah, that's page one hundred ninety one. Yep, and then the white parkland fee, correct? Yep, yep. And then you go down, keep going to one two four zero five one one eight. That's parkland. That is uh, showing. Yeah, it shows fourteen point three five. Yeah, and that's page one hundred ninety seven for those that have budget books. Yep. Yeah, and so the reason that would be a little different when I say we have thirteen point eight available today, there, as you can see here, there's projected um, projected amounts in twenty one that we obviously haven't. We are not obviously, but we haven't hit that number yet. If that makes sense, we still anticipate growing more towards the end of the year with new projects. But 
as of today, right now, the balance is about 13.8. Thank you. And then looking at the, the SIP in the executive budget for, for uh, land acquisition, just to confirm that in the SIP, the 2023 land acquisition amount of six six point three million dollars. That's this quote strategic West Side land asset that you've it, talked about the last couple of years that we would purchase. It, am I remembering correctly with the stormwater utility? Uh, yeah, and a, a, a partnership with our 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 our, par, our friends and partners at Stormwater. That is what it is targeted at. Uh, it is certainly not enumerated as, as you as you uh, I know well know Alder Revere, but uh, for colleagues and for the public. All of our parkland acquisitions, no matter what is budgeted or not, uh, do come through the council process. The only distinguishing factor um, is uh, whether or not it's budgeted is whether it's an 11 or 15 vote item. And I don't think we've yet had a vote uh, for parkland acquisition that didn't get to 15. Uh, I certainly hope we don't ever get there. I think we we do a good job of picking good, good, solid investments and um, so that doesn't it's not enumerated which one it's for but that is the number where it comes from alder thank you so so just to close on, on the topic of uh land acquisition park land acquisition and the deficiencies downtown in your system our system uh, it, i don't want to put words in your mouth eric but but it's fair to say that obviously our issue has been securing a location not the budget authority because um this money has been available year after year after year, and it's just a matter of finding uh, willing sellers. Uh, and and eminent domain was something that we tried and failed at, as you recall. Uh, so so can, can you just commit that that this is still a priority for the uh, it, park yes. division? Uh, absolutely, all the Revere. And like um, very frankly, we don't we we ceased budgeting it year after year after year as a numerated item, only because of that lack of uh, progress to find a willing seller and the um, I would say lessons learned from eminent domain approach uh, more than failure, but certainly not the desired outcome we had when we set out on that approach. Uh, so even with a way to look at this is even with like I said a, a potential couple million dollar acquisition this fall. Uh, I hope, um, and a, a six million dollar acquisition in 2022, 23, 23, uh, we would still be north of six million plus the growth between now and then, uh, which I think is fair to say with the current economic activity level on building permits should be anticipated to be three to four million dollars and keep us, you know, by the time that six million, if it closed in 23, we should be right back around ten million dollars, uh, you know, in in our um, available resources. And we do want to make sure we cycle and utilize those funds as, as appropriate. We do have a time frame that we need to utilize those funds in. We don't just spend it willy-nilly for sure. We try to make sure there's strategic assets to expand our system. But the downtown park, finding it, if we had a willing seller with an acceptable site, um, I have very little doubt that we could size appropriately um, the budget, that we have the budget to buy that appropriately sized park in the downtown core. Thank you very much for your continuing commitment on that, Eric. I'll just say again, perhaps more for my colleagues' benefit, that the uh, uh, increased densities downtown show no, absolutely no sign of slowing down. Uh, And we will have before us in the next month a proposal for uh, uh, 1,100-bed apartment uh, in this park-deficient core downtown area, as well as, ironically, a proposal for about half that number of beds on the exact site uh, that we had looked at a few years ago to potentially uh, acquire. Um, so so the, the, the interest uh, in, by the development community in increasing densities in very dramatic fashion in this area is, is shows again, no sign of slowing down. Uh, then with that said, uh, continuing the theme of park deficient downtown, given the tremendous densities, uh, I, I considered it kind of, Eric, a dubious distinction that you called out specifically the Senior Center Park in your agency uh, budget memo um, uh, to to the finance director this summer in terms of an example of a delayed project. Uh, could Could you, without talking specifically yet about the Senior Center Park, could you speak to the concerns that that you and your colleagues have citywide, um, you know, 
terms of, for example, increased construction costs uh, and and uh, the reinvestment that we need in our system. And in this case, of course, it's a little confusing because it's actually a planning division asset today attached to the senior center, not a parks division asset. But in my last communication uh, from Mike on this topic uh, and, and to the senior center director, Sally Jo Spaney, uh, the main concern or the continued delay wasn't was both community engagement, but also park staff reductions in the planning section. Uh, and that communication was several months ago, I think it was in April. So can you speak more generally to what, and I realize this is more an operating budget perhaps issue that we'll talk about next month in more detail, but but can you just com- confirm for us what your staffing levels are in the planning section today? Do you have vacancies that are prohibiting our program from moving forward? Uh, as policymakers might expect it to. And, and then secondly, how, how significant are these higher construction costs on, on our, our capital budget plans for, for parks? Yeah, so the uh, I'll answer the second one first. And I'll, I'll say answer that just because we just got bids in for the Olin faci- Park Facility Renovation at, at below um, uh, the engineer ex- as estimate. So that was our first bid. Yeah, no, no kidding. That was our first significant kind of, you know, multifaceted mass array of, uh, you know, materials and mechanicals out on the street. So, and, and I want, you know, facilities management and Mike and, and our team did a really great job on that bidding project, got four bidders in, uh, which is phenomenal. But so I'm a little less concerned today than I was three, four months ago. And there's some stabilization, um, in the in in, it, uh, in the cost profiles, I think across the board for parks and what we build, that's not to say there's not inflationary pressures, but the erratic nature of the inflationary pressures we were seeing coming out of 2020 into 2021 seem to be settling a little. Uh, certainly, here in a moment, Mike can interject what he's experiencing or seeing as a as a lead project manager. Uh, but on the on the front of staffing, we we are down one position, and it's really um, a significant. Uh, position. It's a vacancy. So Sarah, Sarah Lerner, um, who has, was with us for a number of years, she led two park and open space plan updates. She was uh, an amazing uh, leader as far as in working with development review. Uh, she led an ad hoc committee on downtown public restrooms for those who are from, from that time frame. Um, so she, you know, she's just very multifaceted uh, and also managed many construction projects. Uh, very talented. She she uh, took her talents to the engineering division, uh, and and is doing quite well over there, working with Janet, who stole her. Uh, but that's okay. No, so we lost Sarah, and we wanted we had to we were trying to reevaluate the position a little a little bit, and also save some funds a little uh, uh, to meet salary savings goals. But we wanted to see if um, tying we could tie anything about asset management to it. But the reality is, Mike. What? Or I'm sorry, I'll revere what you just said. Is true, and we realize we're we're letting um, we're letting too many things slip. So we are in the process of trying to fill that position, uh, but pending it is a potential um, it is a potential reduction, like a, a permanent elimination of that position in our operating budget uh, potential reduction plan. Uh, it's not what we aspire for. None of the reductions were, uh, but as far as um, where we were committed to to start the year in a work plan and what we had almost immediately within the year started. Uh, we were down that 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 position from the beginning, and then between Mike, Mike, Ann, and Corey, and Kate, and Sarah, including Dan Rodman, even that plan that unit that's our planning and development team. Uh, they've also been pulled in a lot of directions with overarching vacancies and uh, management responsibilities in the Parks Division over the uh, last couple of years. We've got some pretty key vacancies we haven't been able to fill and get filled for a number of reasons. Um, some of its funding, some of its failed recruitments, those type of all, all the things. But um, so the planning development team has been kind of backfilling a lot of areas for us. Um, and, and so absolutely we're behind. We are absolutely um, not going to achieve the work plan that we set out for in 2021 when we did this last year. Um, I'm hopeful that we have a 2022 work plan that allows, um, I won't say catching up, but the, the to kind of um, we can accommodate what we've got on the table, 
plus what's in 2022, I think in that work plan, we are soup, we are very much so focused on not increasing uh, that more because of what you just described. We recognize the impact of committing and then not getting there. That's a big problem uh, for us. And it's a big problem of building trust with our community. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And, and I realize that we're talking about operating budget technically when we talk about your staffing, but but of course it immediately comes to mind that I would presume that this vacancy would largely uh, bill their time to impact fee, uh, uh, you know, and geo borrowing um, supported specific projects. The the position is currently budgeted as a 52%, I believe just slightly over 50% uh, capital budget billing. Uh, and that's tied also Sarah uh, had been heavily leading our development review process which uh, interestingly enough to collect the impact fees and do the development review process that leads to the impact fee collection uh, that part is not something we can charge to impact fees yes thanks to Dorn Vistie's legal advice I know <laughs> right uh, so anyway when, so so moving on and I realize there are other colleagues that, that are seeking to ask you questions now I was purposely trying to to go last uh, but but uh, um, anyway, the, as it relates to the, the senior center park, just to refresh your memory, in the 2020 adopted budget, there was a $700,000 appropriated, 680 in impact fees, and 20,000 in geo borrowing for planning. Again, given that what we legally can can do with with impact fee money, so that money is there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In terms That's correct. Of, thank you. Thank you very much. So again, I'm going to probably send a, the link to this video to my constituents that keep asking me about the, the improvements to the very deficient senior center courtyard with tripping hazards and and um, really uh, lack really poor maintenance. But but in any event, so the remaining budget, budget authority is there. Given your response to my question about the higher construction costs are you and Mike and I and perhaps you would need to get back to me later on this rather than responding now but but are you too comfortable that the seven hundred thousand uh, dollars is sufficient for what we have at least at this point in vision for improvements to that green space or or would you suggest that I consider a budget amendment? I would need to either have Mike can either answer that question or we can get back to you. I do not. I have not looked at it closely enough to to recall where we were at. Correct. I think I think it takes. Uh, I think revisiting it would would be beneficial. So I, th I think if uh, Alder Revere, if you're willing to give us a day, I'll certainly get something back to you here shortly. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I'm sure Steph is listening intently for potential budget amendment here. I'll just close by by putting in a pitch and saying that I think it made a lot of sense dealing with the pandemic to hold off on public engagement for reimagining this this really postage stamp size green space uh, but but people keep asking me why the delay and now that the senior center has reopened and there's a new nutrition site with people uh, enjoying meals every day at the senior center now uh, and we hope everyone's fully vaccinated and so forth and are masked up. There is, an, there is a strong interest, just so you know, Mike, uh, to begin the public engagement process uh, and, and you know, realizing that, that residents at Capitol Center uh, apartments are, who are the main users of the space today likely aren't technologically savvy. There was a, a strong thought that we would have a first public engagement in person with them, either at their community meeting room or at the senior center. And so I, I realize your work plan is is exceedingly ambitious and you're short staffed, but I, I would love to move forward on this sooner rather than later, um, and certainly not wait for for the pandemic to to end since this, the senior center is reopened to the public now with with safeguards in place. Uh, and and then you know lastly, from a racial equity and social justice perspective, for those that aren't familiar, uh, the the current users of this space are all exceedingly low income, they're senior citizens, they're people with disabilities um, that are all living uh, for the most part in affordable housing there. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think there's a strong case that can be made that this should be a priority amongst the many competing um, you know, projects that you have. 
Uh, and again, given that we have this remaining budget authority that's been in place for, for a few years now. So anyway, with that, I'll yield. Sorry for the um, pitch at the end. I know it wasn't in the form of a question, but appreciate all of your responses and look forward to connecting with you in the coming days on these matters. Thank you both. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder Verveer. President Abbas. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, great to see the budget really address a lot of equity and equity related uh, uh, projects. I have a very quick and brief question about land acquisition. And if my memory serves me well, uh, if we go further north of um, Remish Farm, there was 30 acre wooded area, which I believe the park was interested to protect that land. I'm just curious if you have any update where we are in the process. I just don't remember the name of the parcel. Yeah, um, some people, uh, the, what you're referring to all there is, I, I don't think it's much of a secret at this point um, at all. Uh, the the Horning Woods uh, yes. parcel, yes, yeah, yes, at the corner of Sherman and Wheeler and the, and the trees. And certainly, um, I hope tonight to be writing um, something that looks like the starting point to um, a final purchase and sale agreement at uh, we have, that's the, uh, for all the Revere's reference, that's what I was referring to earlier in a, in a size of acquisition yet this fall. It would be our hope. We'd love to close this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, we have a, we have an adopted um, um, urban forestry task force report. And it tells us a lot of things we should do um, to protect and promote our urban forest. And I can assure you, I don't know that it's as clearly listed as the number one priority, but the first thing we should probably do is protect really good quality forest woodlots when we can. And this is an opportunity where it's an adjacent to an existing park and basically effectively connects um, to Cherokee Marsh. So that is our goal. And we hope to be able to close. Um, I believe the seller remains interested. I hope so, as of last week he did. And um, that is our goal. Perfect. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Abbas. Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is for Eric. Um, first of all, regarding the Wireless Park improvements, I see there's 200,000 in 2022 and 125,000 in 2023. Could you speak specifically to what uh, you see that money being used for? Um, Certainly, and and uh, and obviously, there's uh, there, you know some modifications from the uh, from last year's SIP into the request this year. But certainly, our starting point uh, would be uh, as you're as you 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 know the interim the intermediate interim solution work on the um, the pad and vehicular access or limitation of vehicular access is is happening now essentially with mm -hmm. already allocated resources. So that three twenty five is really tied towards. Um, scoping a de, we we need to scope the phase right because 325 probably won't get us to full design development of drawings but scoping a phase we think it's most likely the the roadway park south parking lot area southern side of the zoo front side of the beach or back side of the beach um because that as you know and we've heard from many constituents that the the parking and roadway facilities are just absolutely failing uh, that 325, we would likely target to design development. So, right, we've had the public engagement, we've got a master plan. There'll still be more, but, you know, once we get to the design development of drawings, but we'd, we'd really likely go ahead and start working towards that. Now, we do have to have a, a thoughtful conversation of, um, since we have some more input at the back end of that design development, you know, with the public, that I think there's a fair question of how far we take that design development. Do we take it all the way to the public, get feedback um, if we don't have funding to build it right right away? But um, but that's what we would target that funding for. It's that 325 has kind of always been tied to that first phase professional services construction drawings, essentially. From yeah, master, well, from master yeah, plan to construction drawings. I appreciate that. Um, but my concern is, um, you know, we spent money on a master plan and we had a tremendous amount of resident engagement and there's nothing in the SIP uh, towards implementing this yet. We're going through a master planning process for the Lake Monona waterfront improvement project, something I very much support and it will involve a considerable amount of resident engagement. Yet we have in the SIP 
what appears to be actual implementation funds. And I don't think it really serves our residents well for us to engage in a master planning process and not give them any idea, any clear idea when they're going to see the fruits of all that work. I think it, and in some ways it's frustrating. And I, I would hope that we could give the, the residents who give hours and hours of their time some indication of when they might see these uh, the plans implemented. So are you thinking maybe 10 years from now we'll actually get started on real implementation or what do you anticipate? Um, I think that is one of the 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 hardest questions uh, I'll have probably tonight and we set with a lot all their all their ever's um but I don't think the Vilas roadways and parking lots can last 10 years um we're we're now past the, the 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 hot patch cold patch combination patch we've done the pavement is literally washing into the the lake right uh so we got to figure that out we 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 did have some um we, we have budgeted uh, back when we started the master plan. We did have budget identified for Vallis Park implementation because, um, quite honestly, this is a cycle we've gone through many times, um, unfortunately. And in my tenure, it's a lesson I'm learning, right? That James Madison, we had funding in the budget back in whatever year that was. As we did the master plan, that funding got removed from the budget by the time we got the master plan done. So now we have a master plan of James Madison with no funding to implement. It's a similar story of Vilas. I actually worry um, about Lake Monona Waterfront too, but I think we have to get creative and we got to think about what resources we can bring to bear that aren't city geo um, and how do we do that. Um, certainly the impact fees can help, but as I said earlier, the impact fees are certainly not uh, going to generate the, the kinds of massive reinvestment in existing infrastructure we need. Uh, I tend to think we need to look a little closer into what kind of um, what kind of um, engagement we can do with the, the the nonprofit and grant space a little. Nobody wants to build a parking lot for sure, but there are things and elements that maybe could be. Uh, we're going to have to dig deeper because we're in an untenable. Um, we have too many infrastructure uh, assets that are le legitimately failing. Um, so I, under, I understand your frustration. I really sincerely do. And I know the number of people I've heard from in the Vilas neighborhood who worked hard on the plan and feel disappointed with where we set today. Well, I appreciate that. And perhaps as a result of some of this study and scoping, maybe in uh, subsequent years, we can move from the horizon plan actually into a, a capital improvement plan and, and, and budget for actual implementation. One other question real quick. Um, regarding land acquisition, you know that one of the concerns uh, of Bay Creek residents in the whole process of uh, the Truman Olson project and the 150 units of affordable housing that's going to go there, and, um, and with additional developments along South Park, there are going to be more and more families with young children moving into that Wingra Triangle space, and there isn't really any any green space for them. We couldn't put green green space into the Truman Olson parcel, the three and a half acres, because it's tight. There really isn't any room for it, but we promised the residents, and we had this public discussion where we would find something along the lines of a pocket park or a mini park within that area so that the kids, young kids, would not have to cross busy streets like South Park or Fish Hatchery to find uh, green space and a, a place to play. Um, would the land acquisition monies that we have currently in the budget be sufficient to get started with that? And uh, secondly, if so, would you be willing to include more express language into the budget that would, uh, you know, tie, tie us to actually moving forward in this regard? Yeah, that uh, all there is a good question. And certainly we've made that commitment to the Winger Triangle and it, and it really is a um, a space where with all the, what all the Revere talked about with growing densities and having no willing sellers in downtown Madison, this is a space um, right here, right next to my house, actually, that we could potentially not do that, not replicate that problem. Uh, so it'd be, it's unique for us to target uh, land act funding for a new infill um, acquisition. Or it's not unique. It's a little unique, but not unheard of. We've had downtown funding before. We generally try to draw the line of like, is there a probable location that could work? 
in the Winger Triangle, as I said at the time, and I, as, a, as I've said to the property owner uh, who, who owns that property, there's a very logical location for, for a pocket park. And we are very open to timing that to when it's good for them, right? And happy to pay a market pr- price, happy to pay less than market price if we can. But we're, you know, we are, ha- we are happy to pay them for that land on their timeline. I, I have not gotten to the point of, you know, more formal meetings and structure, letter, letter kind of things. Where we're on the same page, but have I know they know. I think they have an interest given their presence in the in the triangle. And uh, my hope is um, we can, you know, I have so I have no problem with it being in the budget. It will be something that is a priority to us because the level of density in the triangle is significant. And if we just have a pocket park to anchor it, we can let that um, connect with the safe streets that are being designed as a part of it into the larger uh, green corridors that are serving you know, the broader Bay Creek area, including me. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it being in the budget. It is certainly something we're aware of. I think in this case, we have a potential willing seller. I think we should all be very cautious of expecting a specific time frame of that acquisition. Well, you and I can discuss yeah. that one, but thank you very much for your time. All right. Alder Wahilahe. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Eric, thank you for the presentation. As you are aware of, uh, I have uh, one concern and, you know, questions since I came into office, you know, the Country Grove uh, Park. And as you are aware of, Country Grove is on the top 10 athletic reservation annually uh, with recent expansion and growth in nearby residents. Uh, and, you know, as I want my colleagues to know that you know, in uh, District 7 has no park with public bathroom. And it's a need versus a want. And I was wondering, you know, where that project is, as you you and I had many discussion that you were going to include uh, at least master plan into the capital improvement budget, and I don't see any. And I'm wondering, you know, where, where, where we are in that uh, regard for uh, a country growth park. And I appreciate that. And so that's a good question. And it's a, it's an answer I don't love to give, but it's true, which is um, the Country Grove, uh, Country Grove Park and the recent expansion, we just kind of expanded it a little bit towards, um, uh, towards the east this, this last year now. Uh, Country Grove is a community park in a, in a heavily pop, you know, in the middle of a uh, growing uh, dense, uh, density area, there's certainly the level of density with the new development is, is notable. Um, we do not have a public reservable uh, space or restroom in, in that park or in that district. Uh, the closest uh, public park facility like that would be at Elver Park, uh, where there are two. And after Elver, I believe it'd be either Marlboro or Garner uh, Parks. Uh, would be the next closest um, uh, facility you could reserve and you know have an event and also have a restroom. Uh, so there's there's no doubt that there's a need um, from our standard, right? That's how we've designed the the system is we have the anchor community parks, the larger parks that host athletic events, shelter reservations, and uh, and other community events, and, and have a more wide array of services and amenities. Um, the Country Group Park was built at a time. Uh, much like some of uh, a number of other parks in other districts where the community park was amenitized differently um, and they didn't include restrooms as a standard approach. Um, the the best corresponding park I think I can think of off the top of my head would be a combination of either our, either Blackhawk Park and Alder in District 9 or uh, potentially North Star or even Door Creek in District 3. And our pros, when I started in 2014, um, we certainly are aware of those those issues where we have a geographic um, gap in what would be considered pretty standard to have somewhere close by amenities like a, a restroom and shelter facility uh, in the in kind of centrally located. Um, we have worked to address the Door Creek deficiency uh, that was that was chosen um, first, given the 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 interstate separating that entire Grandview Commons and East uh, area from, from any like facilities. That project has been in, out, and around the budget for about seven years. It is currently in design development now with a budget to complete it. 
but it is a new amenity. And with Country Grove, uh, it, as we had discussed, and as I had said, I, I do I do support and understand the need for it. Um, however, uh, we have a very I made the very difficult choice uh, about not including in the, the the next two years of the work plan. Uh, I think is really built off of the last two, you know, the SIP from two, three, four years ago. That's how we try to operate. In the out years, we did not yet include it. I think there's room for discussion about the prioritization about a new facility versus rehabbing a facility. Uh, so the combination between our our budget and facilities management park improvements, we we routinely upgrade and try to rehab. Uh, facilities, including full replacement. So Warner, Esther, uh, Lakeview, Obrick are all examples. Obrick, Walter Street are all examples of the what we call um, uh, our more standard, our new standard restroom and uh, reservable facility we've been building. Um, there's an annual kind of program funding that we try to work in there for new one new facilities. That's been a that's a, takes a little more work, uh, but. And much, and I, I didn't finish by saying Blackhawk, which I mentioned earlier, is still in a community park status that doesn't doesn't have one, and, and there are others. Um, and I get the f- frustration you um, you may have, but certainly some of your neighbors who I know uh, do have about that lack of, of service. But it really is about resource, both staffing and dollars, and, and the prioritization we've we placed on heavily prioritization on maintenance projects, and we've had to be pretty pretty stretched in on new amenities. And I understand, you know, I for a new project, it can take a lot of time and effort and resources. But my my struggle is a need versus a want, you know, where, you know, the city is investing a lot of money in improving some of those parks. And while our kids who are in District 7 who are you know playing soccer? They cannot have bathroom, so that's a need. And how can the city just undermine the need of one district for the other? Just you know, project improvement, park improvement, that's a want. And I'm just wondering, you know, what's what's the criteria that's used to take priority for which park to improve or which parks to uh, have the project implemented? Yeah, and, and that's a and, and that is a, certainly a good question. We have the the first is uh, you know the first step is looking at consistency with the goals and recommendations of the current park and open space plan. So for um, uh, I, I think it would certainly be reasonable to say that a community park of Country Grove's size, its growth in actual park space over the last couple of years, and the growth in corresponding service number population uh, scores pretty well there. Um, we we look at it for look at this from an alignment with the city and parks visions, racial equity and social justice initiatives, and including equitable distribution of park amenities throughout the city. Uh, we look at uh, service areas and proximity to similar existing facilities, uh, and and consistency with our current uh, division policies and guidelines. Right, and then um, there is then in the, towards the end of that list, it's actually the slide that's still up, is the associated long-term operational maintenance cost and corresponding uh, tax levy implications for our operating budget. And that is not the, um, so I guess we should back up. The problem isn't that it doesn't score well at all on a list. The issue, Alder, in, in my estimation, is there's a lot of needs and a lot of them being replacement needs um, or large scale significantly planned needs the the on the the pie chart there we can see that seven percent of our sip in total is for the warner park community recreation center expansion um, that is four million dollars of resources uh, you know to that location but i think it's a good investment it's been long planned long sought after and and programmed uh, for years and even it went through at least two or three bumps and bruises from the budget process of timing and we are here today and and i think what you're you're stating is not untrue we have a lot of needs that we've established as needs based on our standard that i don't know how to deliver on in time and resources with that the expectation without without cutting corresponding other things which we certainly can do we can we could be off on our prioritization all there i never discount that we absolutely could be wrong 
Thank you. I, I will definitely follow up with you in terms of the amendment yeah. process. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And and I know you'd reached out and we have, uh, I can tell you, Mike was speaking tonight, you met, uh, we have some information for you on timelines and uh, cost estimates and, and that, that type of thing that I didn't want to go into here, but we will share that with you very, very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Alder, uh, Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks, Eric, for all the good information. Um, I, I mostly just want to make a comment. I want to add uh, my voice to what Alder Evers had to say about those parks with long-standing master plans and processes that have been completed, and uh, uh, the need to um, provide uh, some form of information to residents who. Uh, put so much into those processes. And I realize, as you mentioned, we can't predict the future. Uh, we're, parks is resource stressed in, in several ways, but I encourage you to at least uh, find some way of communicating um, at least what the, the situation is budget-wise and, and, and maybe even some information about prioritization of, of future efforts. Um, I, I do think people get a little antsy after putting all that work into those processes. And uh, I, just one other comment, uh, I'd remind uh, Alder Evers, you know, there are multiple master plans floating, floating around and, and uh, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see who uh, Screams the loudest, the residents, the alders, uh, how these are prioritized. So I hope we can all work together to figure that out. I don't know the answers. Thank you. I, I don't think we should try to use it by screaming. <laughs> Do it by screaming. Thanks. Thanks, Alder Heck. Are there any other questions for Parks? All right. I am not seeing any other alders with questions for parks. So Eric, I think you're finally done. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's the last agency tonight. Um, Dave, do you have anything else before we do a motion to refer? I do not, Mayor. All right. Uh, so then, uh, Alder Revere, I'm going to turn to you, please. Um, if you could make the motion to refer to our public hearing at the September 21st Common Council meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Alder Furman. It's moved and seconded to refer to a public hearing at the September 21st Common Council meeting. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of referral? Seeing no objection, that item is referred and we are at the end of our agenda. Alder Revere? I move to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your evening.